and gentlemen, welcome back to the channel. I've got a very special retro review building up the 2002 catalog here on the channel. I have brought my buddy Tomas back on the channel. Buddy, how are you doing? Doing pretty good. I feel better now that uh, I'm not in the dark and I yeah. have a sort of new recording <laughs> set up here. Yeah. Uh, and the trick to this is it's on my phone and my phone is leaning up against my laptop and I'm letting the backlight uh, put more light on me. So I go. feel uh, more visible now. I don't feel like I'm recording in a closet. <laughs> Behind the scenes commentary track for this review also. I thought you were going to say exactly. you, feel a lot, you feel a lot better because of your clean new hairdo. Oh, well, thank you. I there do you feel go. a little better about that. <laughs> yeah, I'm getting my, uh, yeah, this is, uh, I'm getting kind of shaggy up here. I'm going to, yeah. my, mom, my mom wants to cut my hair pretty soon, but uh in any regard, yeah, so um, I was just going to say, I got my connection, yeah. so. <laughs> and I'm glad to see that you're safe, my friend, with all these uh, fires going on in the state of California right now. I don't know Same if this is. You. Uh, Same with you. Thank you, my friend. Thank you, my friend. It's, uh, man, it's gnarly out there. Uh, stay it safe. Uh, stay safe to all my friends out there in California. Um, this is a rough, rough time. I don't know how the year 2020 can get any weirder, but maybe this is a sign because the show we're talking about today is straight fire. WrestleMania 18, um, the biggest show of the year 2002. As you guys are aware, uh, this is dating back to the very first podcast Tomas and I did on the channel. Um, we talked in depth about WrestleMania 18 quite a lot, <laughs> um, how much it influenced us as fans. This was the first tape we both ever watched. Um, going into this review, like, what were you expecting like, on the rewatch? Respecting um, me going into this rewatch was just every time I watch this show or an old show in general, I try to think of it as my nostalgia versus how I feel about the pay-per-view nowadays. Because yeah. the best example I can come up with is back in the day, Undertaker versus Kane versus Re at WrestleMania 20 was the greatest match of all time to me. <laughs> Watching that match again as an adult, I realized that match wasn't that good. So I always like to see how I remember things versus how I would look at things now. Try, kind of try and take the rose-colored glasses off a bit. Yeah, I totally agree with you. This was a very, very uh, – I don't want to say it was a tough show to get through, personally, because I still love WrestleMania 18 so much. I have a lot of uh, nostalgia with this show, personally. Like I said, this is the first tape we both ever had. Um, but, yeah, point being, I had to take off the rose-colored glasses and put on my uh, my critic glasses for this one because there was – I mean, there's still a lot to love on this pay-per-view for sure. Um, but there's some other stuff that's very, very strange. And we'll definitely get to those uh, throughout this review. But uh, we'll, just go through, uh, we'll just go through each match, of course. And I'll uh, talk a little bit about the build as well. But here it is. WWF WrestleMania 18, ladies and gentlemen. Live from the Sky Dome in Toronto, Ontario. 12 years after they originally went to the Sky Dome for WrestleMania 6, Hogan versus Warrior. Um, Joe takes place on St. Patrick's Day, 2002, actually. Uh, fun little Easter egg is some of you guys might notice. I don't know if you did, Tomas, but there was a couple of uh, fans in the crowd wearing, like, these really fun, like, St. Patrick's Day-themed hats. Uh, the Fink actually had a green vest on. Um, I, was I didn't notice looking, that, actually. Yeah, I was kind of looking at I did at, notice, however, the, the, the crowd sign that said, uh, can you smell what my shamrock is cooking? And I, I, I couldn't yes. get that. But yeah. I didn't realize – it was a St. Patrick's Day reference. I thought it was just mm -hmm. a very passionate Irish fan. <laughs> you know, I didn't I didn't even notice at first, you know, and then on the rewatch, same thing. I noticed, can you smell what my shamrock is cooking? And I'm like, that's a St. Patrick's Day themed sign right there. But uh, yeah, <laughs> exactly. to your point, uh, 68,237 fans packed the Sky Dome that night from all over the world. First thing I got to say is I love the stage for this WrestleMania. This was very simple, but it still felt very grand. Um, considering WrestleMania still hadn't transitioned to being in full-blown stadiums as we're used to it today, they mm -hmm. did this set very well to the point where it made the arena look a lot better, bigger than it actually was. Yeah. Not compared to like years later with WrestleMania 22, when it's just in the Allstate Arena, <laughs> they made the stage look nice, but then you remember it's the Allstate Arena. They do pay-per-views in there now. They wouldn't yeah. dream going to go back to that building uh, no. for, for a WrestleMania. Uh, our first match of the night is William Regal defending the Intercontinental Championship against Rob Van Dam. This Rob is Rob Van, Van Dam's Dam. first WrestleMania, mm -hmm. and the first thing I noticed is that Regal was wearing the championship upside down. Hey, he was wearing it upside down. I was going to ask him, like, oh, man. Considering that, was... that it has been 18 years, 
of me being a wrestling fan, and I have watched this pay-per-view more times than I can count, it took me until this rewatch to realize that Regal was wearing that championship upside down. <laughs> you know, like, Because I saw I, the logo, and I saw the F. I was like, wait, the F's on the wrong side. And I'm like, is he wearing the belt backwards? And then I had to look really hard. Of course, the commentators make no reference to it. Regal probably didn't even realize he was wearing the belt upside down. But yeah. You know, one of those goof ups, I guess. But I, oh yeah, you know, oh, yeah. I've seen, I've seen the show many times, and I was like, yeah, Regal's been wearing the belt upside down. I, I kind of knew that for a while, but I was wondering if you ever caught that. But uh, big pop for Rob Van Dam, I will say that his very first WrestleMania, he was talking to some of the audiences. He was walking down. He's like, okay, guys, I told you, the key to getting an Intercontinental Title match is your arm strength or something like that. Uh, and then, um, wait, <laughs> yeah. The- the first thing I want to say about this match, the only reason why I'm making this comparison is because Regal was involved in the opener last year. I yep. like this match more than his match with Chris Jericho. For Me the too. The title. Me All too. All of the same components were there, except for it was RVD instead of Chris Jericho. Even yeah. Jericho admits that that match wasn't his strongest match he's ever had, uh, especially considering it was his – was that his first WrestleMania? Uh, Jericho, no, his first WrestleMania was the year before in that really confusing two-fall triple threat match that they had for, like, the European and Correct. titles. He had it with Angle. Correct, yes, yes. Uh, yeah. I'm glad yeah. there was nothing that goofy on this show. <laughs> uh, but, yeah. Well, we'll uh, see. We'll see. Um, but, uh, yeah. Again, this match is Fast and Furious from the start. Oh, RVD. Quick. One thing, again, this isn't – and this wasn't just the thing with No Way Out. This is the thing with every pay-per-view. Every match has to start with someone attacking someone else. They don't know yeah. what basic lockups are in mm-hmm. the Attitude Era. Yeah, yeah, definitely. This is Rob, still attitude error. Rob Van Dam, very ruthless quick aggression start. for me. Yeah, ruthless yeah. aggression for me does not start until Rock and Austin are gone. Yeah, yeah, very true, very true. Yeah, you have that little like. To me, the end of the Attitude Era was WrestleMania 17 when Stone Cold turned heel, like for some ungodly reason. Then you have that weird uh-huh. little stopgap in between this and WrestleMania 18, that whole year where you have the invasion angle, also, but um. Yeah, yeah. It's a, uh, I don't know. Yeah, definitely a great point. Ruthless aggression definitely started around the time when John Cena came in and he coined that phrase. Yeah, but uh, yeah. Rob Van Dam, very quick start. William Regal, very early on, reaches for the brass knuckles. But one of my favorite spots of the match is Rob Van Dam actually kicks the knucks out of Regal's hand and then he hits a Van Daminator on him. Regal starts begging him off early on. It's yeah, like, I thought that was very good with the structure of the match because Regal's gimmick for the past few months as reviewed in Royal Rumble and No Way Out is that mm-hmm. Regal can't win a match without those knucks, nope. considering how good of a wrestler he is, but RVD kicking those knucks out of his hands really early in the match just shows, you know, how helpless Regal is without those knucks. Even the commentator said, right. oh, Regal doesn't have the knucks. It's a whole different ball game now. Regal was still extremely lethal with his offense in this match. Rob Van Dam missed a five-star frog splash pretty early on. Regal hits, like, one of the most vicious knee lifts I've ever seen to Van Dam's head. Uh, Van Dam oh, comes yeah. back. The knee trembler. Yeah, knee trembler, yeah. yeah. That's a Knee trembler. That would be Regal's finisher in the later in the latter half of his career. It was. Oh, man. I it was. completely yeah. forgot about that. Yeah, there you go. Great... When he was general manager of Raw in 2008 that yeah 2008 where they decided hey let's push regal finally when he was intercontinental champion when he was general manager of raw king of the uh, ring and when he was on ecw yeah he uh he the knee trembler became his finisher wow yeah see i could i forgot completely about that but yeah knee trembler pretty early on um rob van dam back body drops this is a pretty back and forth match there is a really sick neck breaker by william regal and after that you get a nice little uh rest hold sequence and it's at this point that you notice and jim ross points out regal is bleeding from the lip i still have not completely figured out how regal was bleeding at that point um oh yeah uh regal regal his style is very uh very 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 brutal very bare knuckle so i feel like anyone who's going to get into a scrap with uh regal they're they're going to either make him bleed or the other way around he's going to make them bleed but um Mm -hmm. at this point where rvd missed a rolling thunder And Regal hit a very nice Tiger Bomb after that. That was a beautiful Tiger Bomb. Yeah, RVD made that stuff look excellent. I mean, Regal Regal in general makes the Tiger Bomb look really crisp, but RVD selling made it look absolutely excellent. Um, Regal does the Regal wave to huge boos from the crowd. This crowd was hot for this opener. I will just say that (laughs) right now. It really was. Yeah. um, Rob Van Dam makes the comeback. He hits the monkey flip. 
This is one of the sickest spots on the entire show. Rob Van Dam goes for an, like a nice little enziguri kick, and then there's a beautiful counter by Regal into a modified back suplex. He folds RVD completely in half. Van Dam lands like flat on his head on the suplex, and it looked absolutely brutal. And even on this yeah. rewatch, I knew this spot was coming, and I still cringed. It was that terrible. <laughs> but... I think people don't realize how well RVD sells. Yeah. And he sold beautifully for that move. Uh, the ending of this match, Regal attempts to get the Nux once again. But yes. um, RVD is able to counter this into the five-star frog splash. RVD gets the pin. He is your new Intercontinental Champion. Yes. I thought this was a very fun way to kick off the show. A fun way to put the belt on RVD. Um, I, it was a fun opener. I give it uh, two and a half stars. Two and a half stars. Okay. Um, one other note um, about the finish. Um, Regal goes to uh, pick up the Nux from outside the ring because Van Dam had rolled outside at that point. He picks up the Nux on the floor, and Jerry Lawler, with a fantastic call, he's like, oh, this guy's a class act. Now he's picking up trash around the ringside. <laughs> That's right. He didn't say that. Oh, my, you know, and JR was seeing right through that. Brian Hebner disarms Regal of the first pair of Nux. Regal gets a second pair of Nux out of his tights. Van Dam hits the Van Daminator, uh, may have kicked the Nux right into Regal's face. And to your point, five-star frog splash, new champion. The crowd pops. It's a seven-minute match. I gave this match three stars, if I'm being completely it, honest. It, it was definitely a very fun way to open the show. It and was. I feel like every, every WrestleMania needed that opener just to get the crowd going, get them hot, knowing, knowing that this is WrestleMania. This yes. Is, uh, you know. Um, this yeah, was, one of the better WrestleMania openers. This was the perfect way to kick off the show, I think, because you still have the crowd super hyped up. It's WrestleMania, the showcase of the Immortals, and you have Rob Van Dam coming out, who's probably – one of the most popular baby faces on the entire roster, definitely right atop the uh, mid card in terms of the baby faces. And you have them winning the pretty much the second most prestigious title on the roster. The crowd's going to pop huge for that. Of course, they love seeing RVD win it. And I did too. Rob Van Dam was the man in 2002 for sure. Um, oh yeah. Oh yeah. He was definitely, this was the beginning of RVD's push. And yeah. he would be a mainstay in the company for quite a while for the next oh, yeah. five years after this. Absolutely, absolutely. But um, uh, next we have Lillian Garcia interviewing Christian <laughs> for an upcoming yes. match against Diamond Dallas Page for the European title. Oh, uh, I have good things to say about this. I have bad things to say about, say about this. Uh, just leading into the match. Interview-wise, I love Christian making fun of DDP's face. <laughs> um, he's <laughs> yep. just saying that he's going to take back the European title, saying he doesn't need DDP. The buildup for this match is basically – Christian has been a whiny baby over the past few months. He has been losing matches left and right. His gimmick is now the temper tantrum. Whenever yes. something does not go Christian's way, he throws a tantrum. DDP, mm -hmm. being the great motivational speaker and friend that he is, takes Christian under his, ring, under his wing for a few weeks. Christian finally gets a win, and in Christian fashion, he turns on DDP at the last second. That leads to this match. Um, I have some fond memories yeah. of this feud, only because me and my brother – enjoyed watching christian throw the temper tantrum oh to the me point too. where whenever we'd see whenever we would see christian on tv we would say that's the tantrum guy come on do it do the <laughs> tantrum do the tantrum that's the only reason why we ever wanted to to watch christian oh. and even like you know we were watching my parents they would say oh that's the that's the the baby tantrum guy isn't it it's like it's the little things that you remember and oh, when this... he stopped throwing the tantrums we were just like oh no no this, this, that's his gimmick that's what we know him by we There's didn't some... know him as the, the, the tag team specialist. We didn't know him as, you know, today as Captain Charisma. We know we mm -hmm. knew him as the guy who would cry when he wouldn't win a match. Yeah, this was around the point where Christian was on a losing streak, exactly to your point, and he would throw a temper tantrum. DDP, I don't want to say he was like Christian's therapist, but it's like the closest thing to one. And DDP was the reigning European champion at this point for a couple months. And the title's on the line here. Uh, side note, Christian... Yeah, that Christian, of course, is from Toronto, and he mentions in the interview, uh, just like I didn't need DDP anymore, I didn't need the second-rate city anymore, and I moved to Tampa, Florida. And Howard Finkel actually mentions that he's now residing in Tampa, Florida, because he's a heel, and, you know, they don't want yeah, to be yeah, cheering yeah. for him. Um, but um, amazing Christian theme. Some, yeah. yeah. Amazing, <laughs> at last. <laughs> you know, that's another thing. As a kid, and I'm going to be referencing a lot, again, the nostalgia factor of this show, we started watching around this time, so we didn't know that Christian's theme song was about, I'm not with Edge anymore, I'm on my own. 
So we would yeah. sing that theme song and we would have no, no, no idea what we're talking about. Why is mm-hmm. Christian saying he's on his own? We didn't know. We were just like, he's on his own. He's, he's happy. It is. Being oh, a kid, man. what a, as Yoda would say, a, a, a lovely, a, the, the mind of yeah. a child is a, is a very lovely thing. This is also. We have no uh, idea what the hell we were talking about. Yeah, this is also, uh, before we get into the actual match, JR mentions that this is actually Diamond Dallas Page's second appearance at WrestleMania because 12 years earlier in this same building, he drove Rhythm and Blues to the ring at Mania 6 in his pink Cadillac. Um, and oh, wow. Is, I did not know that. Yeah, he was uh, Rhythm and Blues' caddy that night. And here he is defending the European title against Christian, who has a very fast start once again. It's a yeah. with this, this show. This match yeah, also had the Mandela effect on me. For the longest time, I did not remember the European title being on the line for this match. Yeah. And honestly, considering the feud, I don't think the title needed to be involved at all. I think DDP just yeah. happened to be the European champion. So they yeah. said, oh, well, he's the champion. Let's put the title on the line. It had nothing to do with the title. This feud had yeah. nothing to do with the title. It had mm-hmm. to do with uh, – it was more of a grudge match than anything. Yeah. And I remember a few years ago watching this show and just going, is this for the European title? Like, that's, I think that's how – irrelevant the title was in this match that i i didn't even remember yeah the european title is on its last legs at this point i mean it's a great design it's a it's a great title with a great lineage but clearly it was on its last legs at this point um ddp hits a really sweet gut wrench gut buster clotheslines christian to the outside he's jaw jacking with the audience so they're completely fired up um Christian hits a low blow at some point to get the upper hand. He's not DDP with a really sick bump off the apron into the guardrail. He went face first. It looked like it looked like it hurt. Um, Christian mocks DDP, not only smiling like an idiot, but also doing this, the diamond thing. And like, <laughs> the diamond. Oh, uh, I love Christian, but uh, yeah. Oh D- yeah. DDP attempts to give Christian ring postitis. Uh, as you know it out there. <laughs> but uh, Christian yep. is back in control with the abdominal stretch. Uh, discus clothesline in what? What was my notes? Discus clothesline power bomb. Do you think you have any idea um, how to decipher that? Yeah. So, uh, so DDP hit a discus lariat at one point, and then he goes to punch Christian. He fakes him out, and then he picks him up for a sit out power bomb, and that's what gets two. Um. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, Christian goes for the uh, unprettier, as it was known at the time. It's uh, obviously the kill switch. Um, counters into the Actually, diamond I think, cutter. I think Tyler Breeze calls it the unprettier now. Oh, does he really? I oh. think he does. Yeah. I mean, the last time I checked and it was funny because he <laughs> did kill switch and I heard unprettier. I'm like, you know what? That actually fits with Breeze's gimmick. Oh yeah. Yeah. So, it's pretty. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, Just it's a side note. Fun fact. I think they, he, he calls it that. But when Christian came back to the WWE, he renamed it kill switch mm-hmm. because he explained in an interview that he never got a chance to name that move. He said that him and the Hardy Boys were joking around backstage one night, and they said, oh, you should call your move the unprettier because not only does that move look not fun, it, it's not pretty at all to put on. Like, it looks ugly. No. It messes up your face. So, you know, it's the unprettier. Yeah. And they kind of just ran with it. So Christian finally got redemption, and he got to name his own finisher finally after yeah. uh, 10 years. I still love that move, though. It's so clean. Uh, but Christian goes for the unprettier the first time. DDP counters it into the diamond cutter, which is pretty clean. But the diamond cutter is countered into a reverse DDT by Christian for a very close near fall. Uh, and Christian has to keep his composure after the false finish, uh, which is an amazing, amazing gimmick for sure. But oh yeah, oh, it ends up catching up to him. DDP hits a diamond cutter out of nowhere. That gets three. Um Wow, this match was a lot more fun than I remembered it. Two and three quarter stars. Me out of five. too. Me too. I gave it two and a half just because of the length, but yeah, I remember going into this just like, eh, I don't remember really liking this match that much. I thought it was a little unnecessary to have the title on the line. I, but then after watching it again, I was like, wow, these these two for what they were given, they put on a pretty fun match. Yeah, and I know everybody it. doesn't remember DDP fondly in WWE because they didn't really do anything with him. No. And again, as a little kid, I didn't know DDP's background. I didn't know he was uh, multiple time WCW champion. I didn't know what WCW was. Mm-hmm. I knew him as the guy who says, it's me, it's me, it's DDP. Again, the master of a diamond cutter. Looking at this show with the nostalgia factor, it definitely helps looking past all the ugly stuff. Like you don't think about 
DDP was buried in the WWE. They didn't do anything with him. They should have done this, this, and this with him. I just remember Christian's the crybaby guy. DDP was his friend. Yes. They had a match. Oh, yeah. They did have a match, and it was a very good match. I The same yeah. problem, and you'll notice a theme with this show, is uh, the first two matches were very, very short, only about seven minutes apiece. This match, I feel like, would have easily broken three stars um, if it got more time. Same thing with the uh, oh, yeah. match right before that. I feel like the opener would have easily broken four stars for me if it got more time. But in any case, after the match is over, DDP grabs the microphone. And this is an amazing little segment here. DDP is basically comforting Christian about the loss. He's like, not only did you lose, but you didn't lose your temper. And that's pretty impressive. And he pretty much kind of like, the subtext is he's goading Christian into throwing a temper tantrum for them. He's like, even though you lost in front of 67,000 people in your hometown, it's it's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. And Christian yeah. then throws the temper tantrum. Man, that yep. was so funny. <laughs> it was fun. Yeah, I, I remember that a lot. I remember us popping for that. DDP. Yeah, it's then st- yeah. still a DVD, but we popped hard for a lot of these moments. Oh, um, So for the next segment, Jonathan Coachman interviewing The Rock. Oh, I forgot go. about this. So I kind of just wrote down, because, you know, can you really describe a Rock promo? No. So I just wrote down, Jonathan Coachman interviews The Rock, hyping up his match with Hollywood Hogan. But then I remembered, I forgot that this was the iconic promo where The Rock made Coachman say his prayers. Yes. Because he, yeah. asked, Coach, he asked Coachman, did you, did you eat your vitamins? And he said, yeah. He's like, well, <laughs> well, did you say your prayers? Yep. And Coach said, well, I kind of got busy and I forgot. And The Rock looks at me and says, like, what do you mean? The Rock prays every night. He gives thanks every night. So, well, you know what you're going to do right now, Coach? You're going to pray. I want you to put your hands together. I want you to look above, and I want you to get on your knees, Coach. And that's when Coach says the iconic, what up, Jay? (laughs) (laughs) Just thought I'd give you a quick shout-out. The Rock picks Coach up and says, what in the blue hell is the matter with you? What up, G? (laughs) Man, just classic. I think I mentioned this uh, last month for the No Way Out review. But it seemed like around this point, especially on the road to WrestleMania, The Rock was always interviewed by the coach. And it seemed like The Rock was always adamant on embarrassing coach at every turn. Because you remember, like, one of the first promos he cut with him was, would you like to hear coach sing Barry Manilow? And then you have coach singing the Copacabana. It's not on the network, sadly. but kicks him off screen. I mean, of course, Rock with his classic phrase, get out of here, you sick freak. Sick free. Uh, he got but then the he sick proceeds freak. to yeah. Yeah, he got he the sick proceeds freak, to though. hype up his match with Hollywood Hulk Hogan later on in that night. Tears the shirt Hogan style when he says smell what the rock is cooking, which was an incredible pop, unlike what we'll be oh, hearing yeah. later on in the night. The next match, I'm so excited to uh, kind of talk about this. Hardcore we were discussing this. Is on the line as Goldust defends against Maven. Okay. Oh, man. Let me get the positives out of the way before you get into the negatives. Okay. All also, right. some background history. For all you kids out there that are watching this podcast or anything like this, believe it or not, there was a 24-7 championship before yep. the 24-7 championship. And I know oh, a lot yeah, of the that. viewers are going to groan because, like, we know about the hardcore title. But I think this is important to point out. The hardcore title had the 24-7 rule, which meant – anyone at any time could challenge for this title whether it be in a parking lot whether it be backstage whether it be in the ring whether it be anywhere anywhere on this lovely green earth that we are on yeah this title could be on the line and this this rule was a lot more looser because as we see in this match the 24 7 title rule is not suspended during a match a rule that i hate that wwe does nowadays because it's not the 24 7 title if you can just suspend the rule on a whim this will be important later for sure. But uh, yes. you, got, you got Goldust as the challenger in the formality. Uh, Maven is the hardcore champion. He won the title by fluke over The Undertaker on SmackDown. The thing I forgot about this match was Goldust had the gimmick of having golden weapons, like golden trash cans. I love ladies. that. Gold trash cans themselves. A golden shovel that I Jerry love that. Lawler mentioned. Jerry Lawler mentioned Goldust is going to bury this kid with the golden shovel. <laughs> and like. And that's what me and my brother, other than the 24-7 role, that's what we remembered the most out of this match was the gold weapons. And we thought they were yeah. so cool. Again, I'm going to get these positives out of the way right now. I was a little harsh on Maven, as you remember, in our Royal mm-hmm. Rumble review. Yeah, I'm going to go back and say some positive things about him. 
he had a good look. He had the look. He definitely had the look. He had the charisma. Uh, and I just feel like missed opportunity with Maven. I mean, yeah. he wasn't a bad wrestler per se. I just feel like not bad. Again, missed opportunity. Um, they also mentioned that Maven is Al Snow's pet project. I don't think that's a fair enough diss at him because he is the winner of Tough Enough and Snow did host that show. So yeah. that's like saying, oh, you want American Idol? You must be Ryan Seacrest's uh, pet, uh, pet project. I'm like, no. Al he Snow's prodigy. Show. Yeah, they called Maven yeah. a prodigy as he was making his entrance. But here's the interesting thing. I defended Maven during the Royal Rumble review. The roles are going to be kind of reversed here. I noticed in this match that Maven was very raw, for sure. Um, he was my not... first note is, uh, yeah, Goldust beats the piss out of Maven. That's what oh I remember. Oh my gosh, that. the sick, Gold the sick is... bump, <laughs> the sick bump Just that Maven Goldust beating the piss out of this kid. And I remember oh. it being so one-sided. I mean, obviously, watching the match, it wasn't that one-sided. But Goldust is just beating the piss out of Maven. He's hitting him with trash cans. He's hitting him with trash can lids. He is. I think this is the spot you're talking about. Puts the wooden end of the shovel yes. right above Maven's face. Mm-hmm. Stomps on the other end of the shovel, and it goes right up into Maven's face. And yeah. that's all I remember from this match is, oh, my God, this kid is the champion, and he's getting the shit beat out of him. He is, yeah. It was, uh, yeah, they're using all kinds of weapons in this match. Um, Maven avoids a slingshot by Goldust into one of the trash cans. He attempts a drop kick of the trash can onto uh, Dustin's face, but it's like, the can completely misses him. Um, Maven. Yeah, I, I noticed the botch, but I'm gonna complete. I'm gonna compliment how beautiful the drop kick was, and also point out that it it's a, very difficult to throw the trash can and then immediately go into a drop kick afterward. I would have yeah. loved that spot if they didn't fuck it up. I guess what I'm trying to say is, yeah, it was a good idea in concept. Uh huh. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Maven got whipped pretty hard into the barricade. Um, yeah, I remember that. I don't. Um, uh, Maven, yeah, Maven was, was just oh thrown around. The ma- he was he was get this shit beaten out of him. This Maven, is the champion. He, this kid this shit beaten out of him. This kid took a beating for sure. Um, he did. So Maven was whipped into the trash can that Gold Dust had wedged in between the in between the ropes in the corner to absolutely zero reaction. Um, there's some nice, uh, there's a nice little sequence at the end, uh, dual lid shots. Um, Maven hits Goldust with one and Goldust hits him vice versa. Goldust is knocked out of the ring. Maven is unconscious. Outruns Spike Dudley with a referee who is not involved in the match. Spike Dudley capitalizes and he pins Maven. The match is just, the match is over. Spike Dudley is the new hardcore champion. Um, and he's chased. It really ended before it started. He was chased out of the arena by Crash Holly, who then was followed by Goldust, and then apparently Maven followed the parade, and Jerry Lawler called it the St. Patrick's Day parade or something. But I'm going to give this thing a quarter star out of five. Um, Maven was – I think Maven was exposed in this environment. He was still very green at this point in his career. He didn't have the benefit of, like, you know, a year in NXT at this point. He was just thrust onto the main roster. So. Yeah, um, and he's at, here he is at WrestleMania, like, three months after he debuted. Mm-hmm. Uh, I give it a star and a quarter, only because there were, some, there were some brutal spots in this match, considering how short it was. Yeah. Um, again, if it, I feel like, again, Goldust was doing 95% of the work, and if anything, all the credit should go to Goldust. But, yeah, yeah. this match was kind of just there. It yeah. was better than I remember it being, but then again, this match was like, what, five minutes long? Yeah, Goldust, Goldust did all he could to make this little sequence work. I mean, yeah. fun, little, fun little segments of violence, I guess. But Tomas was talking earlier about the uh, 24-7 rule being in effect. This will be important throughout the show, for sure. Uh, we get a little segue here between the next match. Uh, Drowning Pool performs one of the theme songs on stage. Um, and then we get a nice little segment um, between Spike and Crash brawling backstage. Yeah. Al uh, Snow. Real quick before we get into that, <laughs> I, I just think that the Drowning Pool segment was just WWE going, oh, this is so we don't have to show the hype package for Triple H and Jericho later. Because remember, they were telling the story of Triple H versus Chris Jericho. Yes. That's why I think yeah. – I think Drowning Pool should have just performed back to back. We'll we'll mention where Drowning Pool performs uh, later on in the show as well. I feel like they should have just performed back to back the theme song in the undisputed uh, title match. But in any regard, yeah. Um, 
back to the uh, backstage area, Spike and Crash are in a brawl. Al Snow crashes through a big stack of boxes with Teddy Long, holla, holla, yeah, holla, playa yeah. in a golf cart. Apparently, the cardboard boxes kill him <laughs> because he's gone. <laughs> Al Snow vanishes. You know, they just disappear. Yeah, I mean, if you would have crashed into some wood or maybe some trash cans, it'd be understandable. But he crashed into cardboard boxes and he acted like he died. Oh, uh, yeah. What, what if he did? Death that? via cardboard. It's cardboard. But speaking of appearing out of nowhere, the hurricane comes in on a damn Tarzan rope. He flies in. He just bumps into Spike Dudley, who falls on yeah, the floor. Yeah, barely taps him with his toe. Yeah, he pins taps Spike him. Dudley, and the hurricane is the hardcore champion. Um, <laughs> this will be. I'm not mad about that. I'm mad that hurricane swung in and tapped him with his toe, and that was enough to keep Spike down. Like, I, you couldn't have, like, just hit him with something? I, I, I know. I'm complaining about something that happened 18 years ago. But you look at it, and it just looks so bad. It's, yeah, it didn't look very clean. But uh, I, know, I know you were excited to talk about this next match. Kane versus Kurt Angle. Kurt Angle makes his entrance first. Loud, you suck, Chance. I feel like this is the point where the crowd caught on with chanting you suck to his theme song. Kurt Angle, I want to talk about Kurt Angle's promo before this match because this is a priceless oh, yeah. promo. Oh, yeah. My first exposure to how funny Kurt Angle was. The line was, if I won my Olympic gold medal the way these countries figure skaters won theirs, I'd want to shoot myself in the freaking head. In the freaking head. The incident he's referring to <laughs> is during the 2002 Winter Olympics. Um, I guess what happened is during the figure skating competition, the Canadian pair looked like they were going to win, but I guess it was rigs that the Russian team won and everybody was flabbergasted. So it ended up that the Canadian team was also awarded like a gold medal by like proxy. So two pairs won Olympic gold medals in that competition that year. But uh, he was referring to that little incident. This match was coined as the big red machine versus the big red, white and blue machine. Um, very creative there, WWE. Very creative. Yeah, very creative. Um, um, okay, so you think? I know what you're thinking. You, 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 you think I'm going to bash this match, don't you? You think, you think I'm going to shit on this match? You said it was I'm underwhelming. Actually I'm actually not. Because after watching this match, this match was a hell of a lot better than I remembered it. It was really uh, let me good. Say right, let me say right now that Kane was probably in the best shape of his career around this time. Yeah. Like he, so, okay, I'm going to go into a little tangent real quick. I remember one time a friend asked me, what would you do if you saw Kane in your room at 3 a.m.? And I'd say, I'd probably give him a high five. I grew up with that guy. Like, I'm not scared of <laughs> Kane. But when yeah. I saw Kane in this match, I thought, oh, my God, he looks like a monster. Yeah. He looks like something that he was built very well. He, the mask, everything. I don't know. Just watching this match, all of that just clicked. I was like, Kane mm -hmm. looks damn good. He is oh, seven foot yeah. tall. He is cut. And he looked good. He's got so fire. He's got fire all over his uniform. You know, it's like it's the oh, worst. Oh yeah, and what did what did Jerry Lawler call him in this match? Uh, brimstone breath. Brimstone breath. Oh my gosh, that brimstone needs to be, breath. That needs to be on a shirt. Um, but you yeah. have a very quick start to this match as well. Kurt Angle hits Kane with the ring bell. I guess the gimmick was Kane was going into this match with what I'm going to call a concussion. The announcers are going to call it head trauma which I think sounds completely ridiculous in this context. So I'm just going to say Kane had a yeah. concussion. Um, yeah, punches back and forth. I really, really like the story they told in this match. Kurt Angle, Kurt Angle had a target. He was going for that concussion, and Kane was selling it super well. Um, Kane coming back Good with the stuff from – Yeah, yeah both Kane, Kane and Angle. Yeah, yeah, Kane and Angle. Uh, actually, these, these two actually – they meshed pretty well. Uh, Two-handed choke slam by Kane. Uh, some sick clotheslines. Kurt Angle with a nice belly to belly. And keep in mind, Kane is a three hundred and twenty-five pound monster. Um, yeah. And Kurt Angle, as small as he is compared to that, doing a belly to belly is pretty damn impressive, as far as I'm concerned. This was yeah. This was pretty fast and furious for guys the size of Kane and Angle. I think there was one point in the match where they slowed down for a bit, and that was a yeah. front headlock. Yeah, front face locked by Kurt. It was uh, it, they're in there for about a minute or so. Uh, Kane powers yeah. out. He hits a nice looking sidewalk slam. Uh, Kurt hits triple triple Germans. This is one of my favorite spots in the match coming up. Kurt Angle goes up to the top rope, and I'm sure you guys, if you guys are all fans of Kane, you'll know about his uh, patented flying clothesline that he does. Kurt Angle decides to go up top, and he hits a Kane flying clothesline of his own. 
and he starts, you know, taunting to the crowd, you know, as a way to taunt Kane. He's a big red, white, and blue machine for a reason. He goes up for a second one. Kane catches him with a sick-looking uppercut there. Like, man, that was a clean little sequence right there for sure. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, oh, Kane hits the choke slam. You think the match is over. And then at two and three quarter point nine 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 angle, quick, quick as a cat, puts his arm on the rope. Doesn't even yes. grab it. Just yeah. quick as a cat. That like, was a beautiful spot right there. It wasn't a fingertip, but he definitely got his hand on the bottom rope there. Kane calls for the tombstone. He goes for it. Kurt Angle pulls Kane's mask up, temporarily like blinding his vision. Kane is fixing his mask, and then Kurt Angle hits the angle slam for a very close near fall. Um, Kick out uh, ankle lock. And let me ask you, when's the last time you've seen Kane do an enziguri? Oh, I, I feel like Kane was doing a lot of enziguris back then. I feel like that was part of his just normal arsenal. But, yeah, last time but Kane considering, did an enziguri. Yeah. Yeah, no. that was just, just – Kane in his shape right there, seeing him hit that clean-ass enziguri, which it's, is something – Something you don't see nowadays. It has been a long time since Kane has hit the Enziguri, for sure. Um, but let me just say this. Also, Kane was in that ankle lock for quite some time. Kane sold the hell out of this ankle lock. Like, this was, like like I said, my first real exposure to professional wrestling. The way Kane sold that ankle lock, I was completely buying that this move was as painful as it was. Because Kane was in pure agony here. Um Kane climbs the turnbuckles with a bum leg, tries the, the patented clothesline I was just talking about. Kurt Angle notices Kane's on the top rope. He runs at him, belly to belly off the top rope. That looked sick as hell. Um, that leads into the finish. Angle slam is countered into a choke slam attempt. Uh, Kurt Angle rolls through. It's kind of an awkward inside cradle. Um, and uh, Kurt Angle gets the three count with his feet on the ropes. Yeah, the, the shoulder was up, and uh, spots like that just bother me. I will just – it's it, it bothered me ever since recently. I think it was last year when uh, Rey Mysterio beat Samoa Joe, and Joe's shoulder was clearly, clearly off the mat. Yeah. they still counted it anyway. Ever since then, whenever that spot happens, it just pisses me off. Just because yeah. – I, I just think they just fucked that up so bad with Joe and Mysterio that I just – I can't excuse it anymore. If the shoulder's yeah. up, then the shoulder's up. <laughs> it, it is, yeah. Clearly the shoulder was up. Kane was screwed. The feud's over. Um, I'm going to give this match, all things considered, two and three-quarter stars. Three stars is the highest I'll go for this match. Um, it was a better match than I was expecting. It was fine. It's a very safe match uh, for, for, those of, for those of you who know Kane as a worker. He's a very, very easy worker. He's very safe in the ring. Um, definitely like the story. I would have liked the match more personally. This is just a nitpick. I would have liked the match a lot more if the alignments were switched. So, for example, if Kane was the heel and Kurt Angle was the babyface in peril. Because, like, you have a smaller guy as the heel in this situation. But I can see what I you mean know. right there. And especially how the way Angle won, it would have been like a – Oh, quick surprise win. The little guy was able to defeat the big guy uh, under the skin of his nose and stuff like that. And I know Angle was in his, I'm so nice that it makes me come off like a prick angle mm -hmm. to the, you know, him as a heel. But we know how good of a babyface Kurt Angle can be. Absolutely. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. Kurt um, Angle this match was very good. <laughs> it was, yeah. yeah, a lot better than I was it expecting. It was a lot better than I, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, three and a quarter for me, just because it, 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 it surprised me. Like I said, I know I, I, I shit on this match uh, <laughs> heading into it just because mm -hmm. Angle went from main eventing, being in the main event, to just having a filler match with Kane. Yeah. Uh, but no, th this was a lot fun. Uh, to a fun match, to a very not fun segment. Yeah. Uh, well, well uh, I, I don't want to talk about this. I, I yeah, just want to say Godfather chases Hurricane out of the women's locker room. I, yeah. God, we've come a long way. We, 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 can, we can skip it for sure, but uh, just make sure it's well documented to the viewers that Tomas said this match was underwhelming and he rated this match better than I did. So uh, just document that for sure. Uh, but our next Sometimes match. your memories serve you wrong. <laughs> yeah, it's all good. 2002. But uh, our next match is no disqualifications. Ric Flair versus The Undertaker. The build for this thing was awesome. The Undertaker, if you guys remember last month at No Way Out, the Undertaker lost his match to The Rock because Ric Flair comes in and serves justice by hitting The Undertaker with his own lead pipe, allowing The Rock the victory. 
The next night on Raw, Undertaker challenges Ric Flair to a match here at WrestleMania. Um, and Ric Flair keeps denying him. He keeps turning him down. Um, the Undertaker basically decides in the build to this to try and do things to Ric Flair to make him change his mind. So he beats up Arn Anderson on Raw out of the blue, beats him to a bloody pulp. And then the next week, he beats up David Flair in the Tough Enough training facility. And the David Flair bit is what got, um, is what got Ric Flair to accept the challenge. Um, and it's an, it's an amazing uh, promo by Flair. You got the nature boy at WrestleMania! <laughs> also, I got to point out, the I think it's hilarious how Flair denied the match with Taker. But it wasn't just the beatdown on David that got him. It took him going to corporate office and Linda saying, so are you going through with the match with Taker? I'm like, well, he said no, but sure, I guess if you ask him again, he'll say yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, um, I don't, I don't also, remember. I found it, but... considering uh, if you know David, if you know, if you want to, you know, suspension of disbelief real quick. If you remember, David is a trained wrestler in WCW, well, trained wrestler in WCW. Yeah. I just found it funny that he had a career prior to WWE, but yeah. WWE is acting like this kid has never stepped in the ring before. Wild. The Undertaker beat the piss out of that poor kid in that segment. Um, but this match, hey, these once... kids, they got to pay their dues. Look at Dominic. <laughs> totally. Um, the announcers also acknowledge that at this point, the Undertaker is 9-0 and at WrestleMania. Once again, very fast start, and you can tell that this one is personal. So the fast start, absolutely warranted. The fifth uh, match in a row without a lockup. Um, yeah, you can tell it's personal. They start well, mauling each other over the announce table. Uh, oh yeah. Well, this match kind of called for it. Oh, yeah. This match called for the no lockup. Um, mm-hmm. And funny that you mentioned, the, they, this is the first WrestleMania where they started acknowledging the streak. Yeah. Every cuz I I remember going through every single WrestleMania recently and yeah, they did not make any mention of the streak until this show. And mm-hmm. to kind of jump ahead a bit, I mean, as we all know, even at the end, even though it's irrelevant, Lawler says, "Oh, look, Undertaker's 10 and 0 at WrestleMania." It's like <clears throat> this was the last match where they the streak wasn't the important thing. I think from this year on they started mentioning, "Oh yeah, who's going to be Undertaker?" That became the gimmick at WrestleMania. But this was yeah. uh, this this wasn't about that. This was about something extremely personal. And one thing I will say about this match, uh, I remember we had some conflicting opinions about Flair versus Vince. This match was way better than that. Oh, I agree. Way better than that. I agree with that one hundred percent. All things considered, uh, the Undertaker um, is beating the absolute piss out of the Nature Boy uh, in the early going of this match. Um, oh yeah, and that's one thing I'll say about this match. There's not really too many spots per se. It's a lot of Undertaker working over Flair. Uh, mm-hmm. As we know, Flair is the Blade Master, so he blades yeah. pretty early in the match, and you want to say that eighty percent of the match. Sorry, yeah. uh, it, it's all good. Um, but uh, do you remember? Do you remember how Ric Flair bladed? Just a side note. I, I don't. Not in that match. It uh, was basically just bare soup bones from the Undertaker, as Taz would say. Jr. said that the Undertaker's punches were so vicious that it cut Flair open. And I'm like, man, that put Undertaker's striking ability over huge. And I think that led the match even better, um, just because again, as I mentioned before, with the Vince Flair match. This was just a bloody fist fight. If you go back to the days of Dusty Rhodes matches and WCW, the cage matches, it wasn't about the weapons and the blood and the gore. And, you know, it was about two guys that hated each other and they punched each other so many times that they started bleeding. That's the vibe I got from this match. And even though it was no disqualification, even though we got some weapons in the latter half of the match, some interference, it wasn't about that. It was about... We're not going to let disqualifications hold these guys back. We're not going to let countouts hold these guys back. Just let them at it. And that's why there's not a lot of big spots in this match. It's a lot of Taker working over Flair. Um, yeah. Until we get a superplex from the heavens from Undertaker. Oh, my that gosh. That beautiful, and Flair sold it like a mother. Ric Flair sold that like he had both of his arms cut off with a hatchet. And, like, oh, my gosh. Flair is getting absolutely mauled in this match he is and t- taker is taker was awesome in this match as well um and i also got to point out Purposely that jerry the pin oh, 
Yeah. I'm purposely breaking up the pins at this point to torture Flair some more. And Jerry Lawler is like, oh, isn't Undertaker a great sport? He's uh, letting Flair continue in the match. So, so, and, so he has a fair fighting chance. Taker could have ended this a long time ago. And Jerry Lawler also points out that the Undertaker is bleeding with a little cut on his cheek. And I mean, I mean, granted, the blood was going all the way down. But, like, JR was like, Undertaker has a little scrape on his cheek, and uh, Ric Flair is bleeding like a stuffed pig. And then Jerry Lawler's like, yeah, Ric Flair's got a little scrape, too. <laughs> and then he even mentioned something like, oh, it's the blonde hair. That's why the blood's coming out so much. So oblivious, oh, Jerry God. Lawler, isn't he? Like, In the great words of you, what a what an annoying little pissant he is. He, he was a pissant, for sure. <laughs> um, but, yeah, so um, – Rick Flair, <laughs> Rick Flair, you son of a bitch! <laughs> like he, he says that to Taker at some point. I don't remember. Taker does his uh, vintage apron elbow and his leg drop on the outside. Flair, Flair selling was so good in this match. Um, Taker pins him again, pulls Flair up. He's not finished with him. Now we go to school. He continues mauling him. Direct quote oh, yeah. from Taker there. Um, it's almost uncomfortable to watch at this point. It's great oh, storytelling, yeah. though. Yeah. Um, At this point, Taker is going for old school, and this one, Flair finally gets back into this match because he crotches him on the top rope. Yes, uh, they go to the outside, and Flair gets a lead pipe that was in Taker's bike. Great callback, um, and he starts going to town. Yeah, yeah, starts going to town with that uh, choke slam attempt, and Flair hits a low blow. This is some classic Flair here. Mm-hmm. Uh, figure four leg lock oh, is applied, man. and uh, I think I looked away for a second, but. After the figure four, that's when Arn Anderson got involved. Yeah, so uh, the figure four, um, I should also mention, uh, Undertaker was selling that figure four so well. Um, Taker, Taker lays back in the figure four. The referee counts two. Taker sits up, and he has this look of murder in his eyes. And Ric Flair is like, oh, shit. Taker goozles him, picks him up, choke slam out of the figure four. That's when Flair kicks out. He wanted to end the match there, but uh, – the Undertaker also rams Little Nate into the buckle, so there's no referee at this point. Uh, Undertaker grabs the steel pipe. Um, I don't know exactly like how he got to this point, but Arn Anderson makes the interference and he hits a very clean looking spine buster out of nowhere. And I love the follow up into it. Like Undertaker sent Flair into the ropes. Flair reversed it and just in one swift motion. At Arn's age, I think that was the last good spine buster, spine buster he ever threw. Because oh, he yeah. caught Undertaker and slammed him in one quick movement. It was it was it was clean. It was clean as fuck. Is what I'm trying to say. Oh, uh, it was so good for sure. Um, that was a fantastic false finish. Also, probably the best near fall of the entire match, as far as I'm concerned. Undertaker starts mauling Arn Anderson, and Ric Flair is walking around ringside looking for a weapon as Taker is beating the piss out of Arn inside the ring, which is kind of strange. Um, Undertaker, they're trying to get the Dragon Sleeper over as a big, like, submission finisher for the Undertaker. He has it on uh, on Arn in the ring. Ric Flair finally comes in for the save, hits Taker in the back with a steel chair, leads into the finish, Undertaker with a big boot, for some reason, I don't know if it was like miscoordination, but Ric Flair did not go up for a last ride. It looked like Taker was going for it, but he did not hit a last ride. Um, no, he didn't. I think he was teasing it, but then he decided, no, I'm going to do Tombstone instead. Uh, Tombstone, that is the end of the match. This match was excellent. Uh, I gave it four stars. Yeah. Definitely the best match of the night so far. Uh, sure. Yeah, it was just so fun all around. Great storytelling. Uh, Taker and Flair at their best. And like Jerry Lawler said, he's 10 and 0. And there's and a classic o. image of Taker sitting on the apron going 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Yeah, we that's both did it at the same favorite. time. Yeah, uh, that's but, probably my favorite when it comes to Taker celebrating a streak. But mm-hmm. looking at the fingers putting up 10, that's probably my favorite. Yeah, getting the 10 over before Sean Spears ever did. Um, anyway, so I rated this match three and three quarters out of five. It's a great great fight for sure definitely i agree best match on the show so far to me the ending kind of felt anticlimactic that's why i didn't go over four stars for me i don't know if it was because there was miscoordination on the last ride i feel like that's how they wanted to end the match taker hadn't pulled out the tombstone in a while um i don't know but after the match also yeah you got the counting of 10 fingers but you also got to point out that taker punches out little nature again charles robinson just for 
just for good for measure. Just for the hell of it. Just for the Anyone hell of who's it. in... You, I punched you because you're affiliated with Flair. <laughs> or affiliated with Flair at any point in your life. But uh, Hey, the, Taker, uh, why don't you go just find a, a, a teenage Charlotte while you're at it? Punch her in the face oh so God. she can come back and get her revenge. Could here you imagine? Her. Oh, my God. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> but, when you punched me at WrestleMania 18? <laughs> man. But that was when uh, – this match is pretty much when the streak started to become the special gimmick that it turned out to be. Um, it's when the gimmick was born as far as I'm concerned, because to your point, they didn't mention the streak until this pay-per-view. So I don't know, man. I feel like this is a very important match for that reason. Um, yeah, yeah. (laughs) from this match, we go to what, when you get a awesome match like that, you got to have some time to cool it down. So Michael Cole is interviewing. This is what I have written down. Michael Cole interviews Booker T Booker is wearing glasses. So that makes him smart. Oh, my God. So, fun fact, if we're going back to the nostalgia, I don't remember this match being about the shampoo commercial. I remember this match being about Edge called Booker Dumb. WrestleMania! So, Booker Booker (laughs) got some glasses. Because remember, if you wear glasses, you're smart. Yeah. You should know um, this. (laughs) So, yeah, obviously, next match is Edge, hometown boy, going up against Booker T. I wonder who wins. Basically, the match is built around Edge taking Booker T's gig for a Japanese shampoo commercial. Um, yeah, hey, you got to put Edge Allow on me the to point out, somehow. there was a fan with a sign in the crowd that said they're fighting over shampoo. <laughs> I was going to say something about that, like, but it's funny because like, it wasn't until this rewatch that I completely missed that sign in the crowd, and I was like, that guy hit the nail right on the head right there. But this so, match, man, what did you think of this? Thing. So when you have two, but WWE probably looked at this and said, we got two stars. We got Edge. We got Booker T. They deserve to be on this show. But they totally missed the point and put them in a stupid feud as opposed to, hey, let's, I don't know, book them into something meaningful. Not yeah. over a shampoo commercial and playground insults. Yeah. Booker T, you're dumb. And funny um, enough. Because here's the thing. Edge and Booker T are good wrestlers. They are. They're excellent wrestlers. They They're really are. They're the greatest of all time. Mm-hmm. And they showed it in this match. This was, uh, this was a decent match. Um, decent, I'm yeah. I'm pretty sure this is a typo because, I, <laughs> yeah, this is a typo. I gave it three and three quarter stars. No, oh, no, no. I think I, I think I'm, I meant to put two and three quarter. Okay, yeah, I to gave kind of, this to kind of jump ahead. I'm sorry, I just looked. Oh no, 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 no! Like, You're oh. fine. You're fine. <laughs> I mean, three there, quarter star. There wasn't much going on <laughs> in this match. I mean, Booker T is getting heat on edge for a little bit. Nice missile drop kick at one point by Booker T for two. Big spine and buster. Booker, by Booker T's T. spine buster is great. Oh yeah, Booker T throws a mean spine buster. You want to talk about those? Booker T is definitely one of those. Um. Top rope Hurricane Rana by Edge. Really rough landing by Booker T. I don't know if it was botched or yeah. what, but uh, spinning heel kick by Edge starts a comeback. Really, really nice counter, actually, out of the uh, scissors kick into the edge matic for a near fall. Um, Edge is a spinning yeah, heel and kick then, off the top. Oh, yeah. And then Booker dodges uh, the spear and answers with the axe kick, which was another great sequence there. Yeah, Booker T hits a big spinner Rooney at this point. Um Spear by Edge, and the Edge Rooney makes its appearance, and it's the worst yes. Edge. It's the worst Spinner Rooney I've ever seen in my life. But Edge <laughs> plays it up to the crowd, and they're like, "Oh, he's the hometown boy. We got to cheer for him," you know? Um, yeah. Uh, that leads to the execution. Edge wins. This was a simple match. It was a good match. Uh, yeah. Not as good as I rated it, apparently. Um, <laughs> but I just looked at it. And these are two good wrestlers. They put on a good match. It was filler. It was filler to yeah. the max, uh, two and three quarter. Yeah, match was fun. Two and a quarter stars. Uh, so there was some yeah, good counter wrestling here. Um, oh, yeah, some... and I give it that because it's Booker and Edge. I like Booker yeah. and Edge, so why would I? Yeah, yeah. they're in a stupid angle, but that's not, that, that's not their fault. <laughs> yeah, that, that's actually not why I rated it as low as it has. It probably should have yeah. been, but uh, there were a couple of botched spots. Crowd wasn't super invested in this match as I expected them to be. I mean, Edge well, is they from just saw Toronto. Taker and Flair. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, that's very true. Had to get them to cool down a little bit, but 
I mean, you got to send the hometown boy out there for like a bigger pop than he got. I mean, he got a big pop at the end when he got the pinball, but like, it's also very predictable even when the pay-per-view was, was live because Edge is from Toronto. He was in the sixth row at WrestleMania six. Um, so it wasn't, it wasn't as exciting as the rest of the undercard, in my opinion. Very, very uh, oh, no. predictable oh, no. match even live. But uh, yeah, it was filler. The, it was filler. Yeah. Speaking of filler, another hardcore title segment. Hurricane is walking around backstage. Coach catches up with him. And, uh, you know, they're talking about the stupid Godfather angle. And, uh, yeah. Okay, Maybe- just so people know what we're talking about. It was just a very tasteless segment yeah. where Godfather's hoes were in the back. Hurricane was hiding in the women's locker room. And they're talking about their boobs. And they're talking about boob jobs. It was just stupid. And then they caught Hurricane peeping at them and godfather chased them out so coach says hey hurricane we saw what you did in the women's locker room don't you think that's not something a superhero would do even though he didn't do anything and hurricane yeah. said no i'm not a her a perv which i thought was funny yeah uh, hurricane mighty molly, was his sidekick yeah and real quick <laughs> one before i go into what mighty molly did oh my god molly's blonde hair i mean right? i think i'm just so used to seeing her either bald or with the pixie cut Right. So whenever I see her blonde hair, it just looks fake. It looks like a wig, and I just want to snatch it off. It's like you're not Molly. You're not Molly Holly. That's Molly Holly. Oh my God, that's um, Molly Holly right but, there. Um, yeah, but um, Molly hits Hurricane with the frying pan and pins him, and she is the hardcore champion. <laughs> it's the third hardcore title change on this pay per view. For those of you keeping score at this point, ridiculous. But. Uh, from there, we go on to Stone Cold Steve Austin versus Scott Hall, first appearance of the NWO on this show. I got to wear the NWO shirt while I still can, while they're still relevant in 2002. Uh, really fun build for this match. I forgot how fun, like, you know, so, the whole segment, the whole episode of SmackDown where Stone Cold yeah. kidnaps Scott Hall and he ends up branding him with 316, but uh, I don't so, know. So going into this match, remembering it, you know, as a kid, this was our first exposure to Stone Cold Steve Austin. And me and my brother loved how he, you know, he kidnapped Hall. He tortured him because, you know, for kids, Scott Hall's a bad guy. We don't like him. But looking at this feud back then, I think they threw Scott Hall into this just to make him look like a chump. This feud was incredibly one-sided. I mean, yeah. the match was predictable as fuck. You really think Hall's going to go over Austin no. at WrestleMania? Not and at all. in a way, this kind of represents – the Monday Night War, mm-hmm. you know, NWO was the biggest part of WCW back then. And who saved the WWE from going in, uh, going down the shitter? Stone Cold Steve Austin. So yep. in a way, this was Vince's way of showing Stone Cold Steve Austin beat down Scott Hall the same way Monday Night Raw beat down WCW in the ratings back when yes. they got the turn. Back when Rock and Austin <clears throat> and Mankind and Shawn Michaels and Triple H really came in to save the company. Um, Absolutely. Um but it was yeah, this match it, it's just it one sided. I look at it and I see Stone Cold versus Scott Hall. It's it's one it's one sided. If this match would happen in like nineteen ninety six, then holy crap, Stone Cold versus Dude. Razor Ramon, that could be the main event of a pay per view. Yeah. But this th- is washed up NWO. Yeah. Washed up Scott Hall. I mean, nothing against Scott Hall, one of the greatest of all time. This no. is just washed up NWO, washed up Hall. We need Austin. Uh, Austin needs an opponent at WrestleMania. Yeah, um, I Stone also Cold. Heard that this was not the plan. It was supposed <clears throat> no. to be a tag team match involving Kevin Nash, but Kevin Paper Mache knees uh, blew his quad again. So who would have been Austin's uh, partner? Who would have been Austin's partner? That's, I, that's what I can't remember. I think I got to do some research about it. Like, but I think it was supposed to be a tag. I feel like honestly, like. See, I, I'm of the differing opinion. Like, the person in the best shape in this match for the ring was Kevin Nash, ironically enough. And he was the one on the outside of the ring, which does yeah, not make any I, sense. I, 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 like, I think he was hurt. I think he was hurt. I, I, cause if so? he was Because if he wasn't hurt, then he would have been wrestling on this pay-per-view, for sure. You, you got Hall he, versus he, Austin. You got no, Hogan he, versus Rock. You know what? He can't have been hurt because the Raw before this, the Go Home Raw, they actually did a two-on-three handicap match with Rock and Austin against the entire NWO. So Nash wasn't hurt. I mean, unless he hurt himself but, there. or I, I just remember, again, this could be Mandela Effect. Mm, I just remember in an alternate no, universe hearing that Hall and Austin was not the original plan. 
or I, I just remember that Hall and Austin was not the original plan. Hmm. It, it might have been like the original, like that. the original plan might have been Hogan versus Austin, like two biggest stars. That could like, have been. It could have been, but like they decided to go with The Rock. But um, I, and you know, I think that's the case. I think the plan was Hogan, Austin, and then Rock. Like I think he insisted on working with Hogan because yeah. I think Rock was going to leave, but he insisted on working with Hogan. Well, but then they, they're off, there goes Austin without an opponent, <laughs> and there goes <laughs> and there goes Steve Hall. And there goes Stone Cold Steve Austin taking his ball and going home three months later. But this is a point. Yeah, we'll this, get to that when we get to that. Yeah, Stone Cold was at a rough spot in his career. I love him to death. You know, I love Scott Hall to death. Scott Hall was at a really rough point in his life also, so he wasn't really putting his all into the ring here. This match was yeah. not good. I'm sorry. It, yeah, uh, it well, wasn't good. Real quick, I also recall, I don't know if it was this match or if it was a future pay-per-view where – Austin just refused to, to – to, he refused to let Hogan go over. So I think that's why the match never happened. Maybe, yeah. I think in Austin's own word, he said, I'm not jobbing to an old man. So – Yeah, it's well, – so, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. We'll get to that when we get to that. We're a couple months out from that. But uh, I didn't hate this match. It was just so one-sided and so predictable. It was that, kind of boring, actually. I like, mean, you have Austin doing the what – the what kicks you have him bashing scott hall's head into the buckle yeah uh you got i mean austin blindsides kevin nash on the outside at one point and i wrote down why didn't nash just maul him right there like you know he blindsides nash and then nash just stands there for a little bit he waits until the referee is down this is the respectful nwo get this so nash waits until the referee's (laughs) down and then that's when he goes and maul stone cold and i'm like this should have just been a handicap match. Like, yeah, and also uh, Austin made the, NW, uh, the NWO look like chumps because Austin beat them both up by himself. Yeah. He beat down Hall and Nash, and they had a chair, and he beat them up by himself. If this yeah. doesn't personify what the NWO was like in 2002, I don't know what will because if this was NWO in, like, 1995, you know, Hogan would – Hogan – Austin would have been left in a, a, a pool of his own – blood and pits and sweat as Brock Lesnar would say oh yeah he but would Austin beat down the NWO by himself he did Austin would have like in 97 Austin would have been beaten within an inch of his life by the NWO for sure um but Lawler's like look at Nash he's in great shape and then I wrote down then why the hell is Kevin Nash not in the ring right now like why is this not a Again, handicap match and like, unless he was hurt I I honestly couldn't I, 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 yeah, I just, I just, you know, I'm not even going to, yeah, this match was just, it was, it was completely one-sided and it was predictable. And that was yeah. my two biggest issues with that. Austin yeah. was floating. He didn't have an opponent. There was really nothing else to do with him. Yeah. I mean, I had fun watching it as a kid. Mm-hmm. But I, I did too. It one-sided. I did yeah. too. Yeah. Austin hits one stunner, but the referee hits a two count as Nash pulls the referee out of the ring. And then he starts mauling Austin even more. Uh, Stone Cold Steve Austin with a chair. There's some razor chance. He's a heel. Um, stunners to both Hall then Nash. And then Austin has a cover on Hall. And then Jack Doan sprints to the ring. I don't know how the referee did not catch a shot of Jack Doan running down the ramp to go count the pinfall <laughs> like they did with uh, Little Nate at 24. But he counts two yeah. for Austin. It's broken up again by Kevin Nash. Like, again. Yeah, and it's because Nash just – drops the elbow on the ref should have should have should have just been a handicap match you know uh hall goes for a razor's edge hall goes for a razor's edge austin hits a back body drop and then (laughs) this is the this is the part that pissed me off the most so there's a big slew of referees that come out from the back and they approach kevin nash and they politely ask him to leave ringside because he's interfering too much and Kevin Nash obliges because this is the WWE version of the NWO. Like, <laughs> exactly. Again, 1997, the whole NWO would have been down there. They would have beat the piss out of all the referees. And Eric Bischoff would have slid in. And there would have been like a triple quadruple slur- swerve. And somehow Scott Hall would have ended up with the WCW title, even though the title's not even involved in uh, this match. I couldn't believe what I was looking at. Scott Hall hits a stunner. How he fun would that be? Finish. Oh, Scott Hall versus Stone Cold, but booked in WCW. 
As long as Vince Russo is not booking it, I'm all for it. Um, but anyway. In 1999 WCW. <laughs> no. <laughs> but uh, uh, Scott Hall goes for a second stunner. He shoves it into a turnbuckle that's exposed somehow. The camera missed it. Um, and that leads to one of the best stunner cells ever by Scott Hall, who was in orbit from that stunner. That's obviously a three count. I gave the match a star and a half. The work was nothing special. I gave the match a full star for the stunner itself. I love yeah, that stunner. Like, I gave it two stars just because, I mean, it, w- it was a match. It was a match. The fans yeah. were happy because Austin was there. I mean, yeah. Austin, you wouldn't even have to say who Austin's opponent was and he could sell out in an arena. Um, I almost was going to give Hall shit because I realized here's Hall and he's stealing Stone Cold's move. But then I realized Austin can't take a razor's edge, not in 2002. No, 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 no. Stone Cold's, no. Stone Cold's neck at that point was like getting close to a stack of dimes at that point. He could not take yeah. a razor's edge for sure. Um, but at this point, I don't even think Hall even attempted the razor's edge while he was in WWE. Well, you as might far be as I right. Can remember because you might be Hall right. Actually, and Nash, Hall and Nash were gone like three months after they debuted. Hall I know was Hall no showed. Hall was gone for sure, like shortly after the show. Yeah, because I, I think he no showed a Raw. Yeah, and Vince just fired him. Yeah, and that's a, that's a, that's at the point that NWO was pretty much show and Booker dead. T and X Pac and X Nash got injured. Yeah. Nash tore his quad running across the ring. But anyway, yeah, yeah. match oh, was yeah. Then, match was bad. I hated the booking of this match, but the stunner was cool. Um, it was one sided. It, yeah. it was Austin was there to probably sell some pay per views. <laughs> yeah, just in case Rock and Hogan alone couldn't sell the show, you got to put Austin on there. Yeah, remember back in the '90s, Austin could sell a house show, and his opponent wouldn't even be announced. You just have to say Stone Cold's in action. Nope, the, the arena would be sold out. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, but moving on to our next match, hopefully this next match is a little bit better than this one. Uh, what do we got, my friend? Uh, Fatal Four Match for the WWF Tag Team Titles. We got the Dudley Boys, the Hardy Boys, APA, and Billy and Chuck. Billy and Chuck uh, are the match champs. Is a little all over the place. Yeah, this match was a little all over the place. Kind of hard to keep track of what was going on. Yeah. Uh, so I'm kind of just – it was elimination style, by the way. It was, yeah. Uh, so I'm kind of just going off of what I remember. I really couldn't write anything down because there was just a lot going on. Way and there was really nothing worse. Like, what was I going to write down? Ron Simmons punches Billy and then tags J- Bradshaw in. Yeah. There was, just, uh... there was like just nothing noteworthy in this match until uh, APA was eliminated. And then at that which point, is weird, like, which is weird. Sorry to cut you off, but like last month at No Way Out, the APA won the tag team turmoil. All four of these teams in the turmoil, Billy and Chuck end up winning the titles on the next SmackDown. Um, but pretty much APA wins the turmoil. They get the title shot and then they're eliminated first from the match, which is weird. Um, also, yeah, I feel like this match would have been a lot better if it was Billy, Chuck, the Dudleys and the Hardys. But since they had APA with the tag team title shots, they had to yeah. include them. Well, um, I mean, I feel like the match still could have been at least, like, better, like, still with the APA involved. Like, I have a simple fix. Just don't make this elimination style. Just make it a one-fall oh, yeah, exactly. four-way tag match, you know? Like, all yeah. the false finishes you could have, all the saves you could have with these guys, like, it would have oh, yeah. made for a much more fun match. Um, so, this is what I remember from this match. I remember Jeff Hardy's extremely pasty body. Um, I remember <laughs> yep. Jeff smacking Stacey Keebler's ass, kissing her and shoving her off the apron. Tasteless. All I'm going to have to say about that is you could have left it at the ass smacking. You didn't yeah. need to sexually assault her on the way down. Yeah. Side oh, note, side note about, uh, side note about Stacey, by the way, I got to point out that before the match, the Dudley boys were played to the ring by saliva who played one of the WrestleMania themes at the top of the show, actually. Um, and, hey, the two big WrestleMania entrances, the big grand entrances that we're getting are Triple H. Spoiler alert, he gets a grand WrestleMania entrance every year. It's Triple H, and the second one is the Dudley Boys for this match. Um, there you go. Dudley Boys get a grand WrestleMania entrance. Much deserved. 
I think yeah. it's a pretty underrated oh, WrestleMania yeah. entrance. The mm-hmm. guitarists of Saliva are actually yeah. wearing the Dudley glasses at one point, which is pretty sweet. Yeah. Um, uh, but yeah. Bubba Ray is headbanging. His, he's headbanging with the drummer. Did Bubba uh, Ray. He's I hitting love, the cymbals. I love Bubba Ray so much. Um, but Yeah, I just, I, that's, a, that's another thing I just remember from this match is him headbanging with the drummer and then hitting one of his cymbals on the way to the ring. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah, APA and the champions are starting out real quick. Another stiff clothesline from hell on Billy Gunn. I feel like Billy Gunn's the only one that ever did the flip bump on the clothesline. Um, but then yeah. a 3D, a 3D they on Bradshaw. Yeah. yeah, 3D on Bradshaw gets rid of the APA. Um, definitely They're still calling him the one Billy Gunn, which just makes me... <laughs> <laughs> uh billy gunn also oh, went for a uh, do you remember billy gunn's <laughs> other finisher when he was the one the one and only he, yes, had the, I do. he had the famouser and then he had the one and only uh billy gunn actually went for the one and only in this match thank god he didn't hit it but uh in any regard um Team 3D got the tables, to take the words out of Brian Alvarez's mouth. Since when are tables okay in this match? Hey, if there's no disqualifications or count out, I mean, I mean, they got to. Okay. Well, that's. Take the rules. That's fair enough. But then why are people tagging in and out? Like you could just like do the referee's five count and then you just wouldn't get disqualified. (laughs) Like, yeah. I was but like, here's the thing. Why are these are idiots tables tagging? Really illegal? Are tables really illegal? You're not hitting someone with the table. You're putting them through it. Yeah. If anything, Fair tables enough. are breaking the fall. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, Hardy um, Boys meet the Dudleys anywho. outside. Big We Want Tables chant for the crowd. A nice whisper in the wind on Bubba. And that's where we get the uh, Stacy distraction. Um, all, all I'll say is let's just leave it as Jeff puts her down gently. Um yeah, <laughs> I already went into detail about that. So yeah, put your down. My, my my note about that is they, they could have left it at the ass smacking. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I agree completely. Um, big bubble bomb on Billy. Uh, Jeff Hardy was in orbit on a backdrop. I don't remember like who gave him the backdrop. It must have been one of the Dudleys, but uh, the Dudleys yeah. again. Yeah, Jeff. Oh my gosh. So Jeff was in the tree of woe at one point and this is this has to be painful speaking as two males but Bubba Ray gets up on the second rope and one of his feet is standing right where a man does not want to be kicked um I'll just leave it there it must yeah. have been the worst <laughs> as must have been the would worst say, feeling. that's not a fun way to spend a Sunday night no no not at all by the way Taz nowhere to be found on this show former tag team champion um basically a nice counter by Jeff Hardy out of uh Devon's finisher then you get a Matt Hardy hot tag, which is kind of rare in a Hardy Boys match. Uh, Matt getting the hot tag. Um, Matt gets the second rope leg drop. The Dudley Boys go for the what's up on Matt. But Billy Gunn, who's just standing on the apron, pushes Devon off the top rope and through the table that's on the outside. Um, pretty much yeah, that was Hardy's, a nasty-looking spot. Yeah, Hardy's capitalized on Bubba, Twist of Fate, and a Swanton, and that's it for the Dudleys on the night. They're just, yeah, Devon was... Devon was out of commission for the evening. I'll just leave it at yeah. that. You will see later how Devon was still dead after the match, and no one bothered to get him up. No, I think Stacy was after the match. Yeah, she was the only one that stuck around to check on him. <laughs> he was because I saw Bubba leave, and I was like, "Oh, they probably picked up Devon." He's like, "Nope, he was still there. He left his brother. He left his brother's corpse." Devon goes to a table. Devon goes to the table, and then you know they just all leave. But uh, yeah, so yeah. it's down to it's down to the champions and the Hardys. Uh, poetry in motion to Billy, which is a move that I love. Um, Swanton bomb on Chuck. Famouser on Jeff. Um, Chuck pins Jeff after the Famouser, and it's a very close two count. Um, and then Billy knocks Jeff out with the belt while the ref is distracted. If the match is no disqualification, why do you need the distracted referee as far as I'm concerned? And then Chuck pins Jeff after the ref shot. Um, two and a quarter stars for this match for me. Um, action was fine. I don't have any qualms with the work in the ring. I feel like this match yeah. would have easily broken three stars if it was a one fall match. Um, oh, yeah. I gave it two stars. It was, again, it was a filler match. It was get the crowd to settle down. Probably not from Hall and Nash, but more Hall and, Hall and Austin, but more about, hey, we just saw Austin and we – hyperventilated like we always do so they need to get them to settle down from that yeah settle down especially for the uh the next match but before we do so uh 
there is another hardcore title segment backstage. Mighty Molly is running around. And out of nowhere, like, there's a, there's a door that's completely open into a random room. The top half of the door slams in her face and knocks her unconscious. And it turns out it's Christian with the great line, stand back, there's a new champion. Christian pins a woman and wins the hardcore title that way. Um, yeah. I'm so, again, I'm so glad we are in the age that we are right now because JR goes, oh, congratulations, Christian, you pinned a woman. I'm like, wow, way to be little Molly Holly. Like, yeah. Uh, sure that's, your, uh, my ass. that's your fourth hardcore title change on the night, for those of you keeping track. Yep. Um, but, Tomas, here we are. Here we go. Again, we're done with the crap, mostly. <sighs> Let's get into it. Hollywood Hulk Hogan versus The Rock. I feel like for fans of our generation, this is our Hogan and Andre. Yeah. This is the match that you remember from this show. Icon the build versus up Icon. is basically Hogan's back in WWE. He says that he is the one that put wrestling on the map. He is the top tier guy in this company. There is not a single person on this roster that is more popular than Hulk Hogan. Cue The Rock. The Rock comes in and says, yes, that he agrees that Hogan is that measuring stick in this company. But in the classic line that I will never forget, you talk about headlining and main eventing WrestleMania after WrestleMania after WrestleMania. Well, Hulk Hogan, how about main eventing one more WrestleMania with The Rock? Oh, Huge pop, pop from man. the crowd. Hogan agrees to the match. We are on. That there are raw, some things to this build up that the, oh, man. bother me. So, but I forgive it because of this match. Yeah. So that raw, by the way, before uh, before we get into it, sorry to cut you off, but that raw was in Chicago. Huge pop for that segment. It ends pretty much with the Rock hitting the rock bottom on Hulk Hogan. The Rock is walking to the back, and then the NWO maul him as he's walking to the back. Um, Hulk Hogan gets a ball peen hammer from under the ring, nails the Rock with it, knocks him out cold. They brand The Rock in the ring, but they're not done with him yet. The Rock is being taken out on a stretcher. Um, they lock the ambulance door shut. Hulk Hogan gets in this gigantic semi-truck, and he runs through that ambulance with The Rock allegedly kayfabe inside. And The Rock is gone for a while. Um, if to this. there is one thing I will say is bad about this feud, it's that. It wasn't really? I thought They didn't need to do that. No. I, you know what? I, I disagree. I think this was exactly the NWO we needed at this point, and this is like their only glimpse of greatness in the WWE was this like – From an oh. NWO point, yeah, but considering how big this match is, we didn't need the hokey, we tried to kill The Rock, and here comes back The Rock three weeks later like nothing happened. Well, I mean, like, how many times has that happened in WCW where, like, they have the ridiculous, like, you know, semi thing and they toss the big show off the top of a building and he comes back, like, moments later? Um, like, Oh, yeah, I mean, it's happened a lot in the Attitude Era, too. I'm just saying this particular feud, I just feel like didn't need that. Yeah, but, I mean, yeah, uh, it's all about suspending your disbelief. At least The Rock was selling his injuries. But getting into the match, uh, before the match even starts, Hulk Hogan approaches the outsiders backstage. He needs to do this on his own with no interference because this is the respectful NWO at WrestleMania. Huge pop for Hollywood Hulk Hogan coming out. Yeah. Um, so before we get into this actual match, there's actually a few points I want to bring up about this. Number one is, yes, Hogan was over. This is his first one-on-one -on -one match since he returned to the WWE. Yes. And I feel like at this point, they did not care that he was a heel. They were happy to see Hulk Hogan back in the WWE by yeah. himself, and he was over. Absolutely. And I mean, he was over. Mm -hmm. And not only that, this was not only the beginning of Hogan's comeback. This was the beginning of Die, Rocky, Die. This was the beginning of Rocky Sucks. This was the beginning of the fans starting to turn on The Rock. Yeah. Whether it be he was quote-unquote green in the ring, whether he was maybe, I don't know, wearing out his welcome. Maybe it was because he was starting to get a little popular in Hollywood and we were kind of reading the lines, seeing that he was going to be leaving the company soon. Wherever it was, the fans were starting to get sick of The Rock and they had no problem whatsoever telling him how he felt. How they felt. Yeah, it's Yeah, this crowd was completely like I don't want to say completely there were a few rock fans in there but as far as I could tell this was like 60 40 in favor of the Hulkster yeah 
Um, it was so much to the point where you could have did a double turn on this night. You oh, could have had Rock turn heel have. and Hogan turn face. And apparently what happened is the two guys heard the reaction and they actually called an audible in the ring to do something that we'll uh, discuss as the match gets going. But the bell rings and these guys are doing a little stare down and they're basking in all the flash bulbs. And that's an iconic picture I mean, where they're looking around. It's iconic. Oh. Hogan looks left, Rock turns right. Hogan turns I, right, Rock turns left. I loved it. This yeah. match was already, if the This Is Awesome chant existed back then, this moment right here would deserve it. Like they always would say, the fans are chanting This Is Awesome and they haven't even wrestled yet. This was yes. one of those moments that deserved it. And mm-hmm. whether or not this match was good or bad, that's not what mattered. It mattered that we were watching Holly, we were watching Hulk Hogan. Forget the Hollywood, forget the NWO. This was Hulk Hogan versus The Rock. Yes. This is one of those matches the fans never thought they were going to see. This was, as the announcers pointed out, this was what would happen if Babe Ruth went up against Barry Bonds. This is what would happen if Muhammad Ali went up against Mike Tyson. This is Hulk Hogan versus The Rock. And you know what? It definitely delivered. This is one of my personal favorite WrestleMania matches of all time. A rarity on this show. This match starts off with a lockup. And Hulk Hogan has an early advantage, and he poses to the rock, and the crowd is so electric, no pun intended, for that little spot. And Hulk Hogan tells the rock to just bring it. And yep, I was they're like, going back and I'm forth. In. The crowd is making it obvious that they like Hogan and they don't like the rock. The mm-hmm. rock boos are getting louder. The Rocky Sucks chants are starting up. And like I said, not a lot has happened in this match right now but the fans are already hooked. This is the hottest they've been throughout the entire show. And the match finally starts getting out of the way. Rock hits his, I don't even know if this is what it's called, but this is what we called it when we were kids, the slobber punch, the trademark, one, two, three, spits oh, in his hand, yep. knocks Hogan out he of the lays, ring. He lays some smackdown. Wow, so that's why he calls it that. Yeah. <laughs> I always called it the slobber When we were kids, we called it the slobber punch because the slobber, he was oh, spitting into he his spits. Yeah. He spit into his hand and you punch him. We were like, from, oh, look, that's the slobber From my punch. experiences, like JR would always say, the Rock's laying the smackdown when he's giving those, like, you know, patented punches. Um, that's a good point. Hey, let's tweet the Rock and see if he'll answer to us. What do you call oh, that could move you, imagine? you spit into your hand? Rock, if you're watching this, I love you. You're my idol. Um, but anyway, <laughs> um, um yeah, so the Rock, the Rock was getting booed in this match. Um, Hulk Hogan hits a back suplex. Hogan was Hogan was getting some good moves in in this match. You know, he was working. He really was. You know, and you know, looking back at two thousand two and wh- however you feel about Hogan, wh- especially nowadays, I know a lot of people don't have a lot of nice things to say about Hulk Hogan, but I feel like this was one of the best, if not the best, wrestling match you've ever put on. Yeah. Whether you hate him, whether you love him, whether you despise him, you cannot say if you are a wrestling fan, Hulk, whether you are old, young, in the middle, Hulk Hogan has, he's influenced your life in one way or another. Absolutely. We started watching in 2002, and this was near the end of Hogan's career. And even then, later on in the month, I was a Hulkamaniac. I would put on his theme song in my room and I would do the pose down. Yeah. I would watch every single episode of SmackDown and just like, you know. Oh man, I can't, I can't wait to get to the 2003 yeah. stuff with Hulk Hogan eventually. Cause that's, and, you know, um, be in awe that he is Hulk Hogan, you know, whether yeah. you, again, like I know a lot of people don't, I mean, and I'm one of them, like I'm not the biggest fan of Hulk Hogan nowadays, Me neither, but, but you can't deny the influence he's had on every single wrestling fan. Ever. Oh, like, yeah. you can't say that, oh, I'm 15 years old, Hulk Hogan. No, you haven't. You know who Hulk Hogan is. Yeah. If you were in an arena, the place would come off, the roof would come off the building if Hulk Hogan appeared. It's arguable that Hulk Hogan put wrestling on the map in the territorial days in the 80s for sure. Um, but at the same time, you have The Rock who put wrestling on the map in the mainstream, not just, you know, in the, not just nationally, but like, in pop culture, people, you know, they knew who The Rock was. They knew who Stone Cold Steve yeah. Austin was. To an extent, oh, yeah. they knew who Hulk Hogan was also. I mean, you had, like, you know, back in those days, you had Roddy Piper and Andre the Giant appearing in big oh, yeah. budget features. But, oh, yeah. like, you okay, whether you watch wrestling or you don't, if you go up to, like, 20 people on the street right now and you say, hey, you know who Hulk Hogan is, every single one will say yes. 
what you gonna do, brother? Um, he is, you know, the most mainstream person mm-hmm. in wrestling in history. And, you know, even nowadays with The Rock, people know him as Dwayne Johnson. Like, yeah. And some people won't even call him The Rock. There are people I, out there that don't even know The Rock used to be a wrestler. Yes, that drives me insane, too. It does. <laughs> me, too. Yeah. If anyone ever says Dwayne Johnson to me, I correct him. I say he is The Rock. Yeah, I make sure. He will always be The Rock. I make sure people that call him Dwayne Johnson, I'm just like, listen, he got his start in wrestling. And, you know, thankfully, most people, like, in my, you know, in my neck of the woods are like, yeah, we know who The Rock is, Zach. You, it's you like I always him. say, <laughs> if she calls him Dwayne Johnson and not The Rock, she's too young for you, bro. Oof. <laughs> Oof. Um, but in any regard, uh, this is a very back and forth match. Uh, there is a great story being told with the rocks busted ribs and the rock is selling this so incredibly well. Um, Hulk Hogan um, rakes the rocks back to cheers. He's a heel. Um, uh, Hogan <laughs> hits a nice running choke slam. Yeah. Yeah. I never thought I'd say this, but Hogan did a move that I've never seen before. Yeah, he starts choking The Rock with his wrist tape. Uh, Rock goes face first into the steps and the guardrail. I completely forgot they were brawling outside in this match, but you and know, that's there you one go. thing I love about this match because, like we were complaining about in the No Way Out review, we didn't like how Rock and Undertaker were bending the rules a little too much nope. to the point where it's just like a little took you out of it for a bit. But yeah, they didn't need weapons. No, they didn't need interference. They didn't need brawling in the outside and bending the rules. That just shows how, how how good this match was. I'm just right. going to say how good this match was. It wasn't excessive. They didn't go brawling into the crowd. They were just brawling around ringside. And, you know, to me, that's totally fine. Mike Chioda was still counting them out. Kind of forgot that Mike Chioda was the ref for this match. Um, so Rock counters a uh, – yeah, Rock's – so there's brawling by the announce table. The Rock grabs a steel chair. He goes for it, and Mike Chioda grabs the chair from behind, which is always a really cool spot. Hulk ends up clotheslining him. Uh, back into the ring, The Rock is knocked into Mike Chioda. Um, there's your uh, first ref bump of the match. Um, <laughs> Rock hits a spine buster to loud booze. And here's the sharpshooter. Um, here's a rarity. Hulk Hogan actually taps out to the sharpshooter, but there's no referee. Um, When's yeah, the last time yeah. Hulk Hogan tapped out? Uh, Kurt Angle. Oh, oh, at uh, King of the Ring, I think. Yeah. A yeah. lot of people like to say, when's the last time Hogan and John Cena have topped, tapped out? And I tell you both, Kurt Angle. Yeah, Kurt Angle has made a lot of people tap that a lot of people tend to forget yeah. about. Um, um, but after that, uh, <laughs> Low blow by Hogan, and Hogan hits the rock bottom. Yes, Hogan bottom. Hogan, Hogan bottom. Hogan bottom. That is 100% <laughs> what I wrote, but I didn't want to say it. Hogan bottom. Uh, yeah, hey, you said, out. you said Jericho bottom during the Rumble review, so there you I go. I did. Returning That's the why favor. I wasn't going to say it. Yeah, Hogan uh, bottom, there. And then, yeah, a very, very nice false finish, and then Hogan uses the leather belt on the rock. Ouch. Believe it or not, that's classic Hulk Hogan right there. It is. Even in the 80s, he was using that belt to whip his opponents when the referee could see. He was. You know, uh, to fast forward a lot, I think it was in his match with Randy Orton in 2007, Hogan was doing a lot of eye poking and back raking. And the commentators had to say, everyone, please remember, Hogan has a mean streak. He's not always Mr. Yeah. Good Guy and, you know, does what's right. Hogan has a mean streak. Yes. <laughs> Oh, this is um, where the so match classic, gets yeah. incredible. DDT by The Rock. The Rock has the belt now. Um, he starts laying the smackdown with the belt, and then he does the spit on the belt for the last shot. Um, he hits a rock bottom for two. Hogan starts hulking up, and this is the audible that I was mentioning earlier. I feel like this was called on the fly because they recognized that the crowd was cheering for Hogan like more than they were expecting, and they were like, you want to Hulk up? And Hulk's like, let's do it, brother. And yep. it was awesome. It was yeah. so great. It was huge. And Rock sold it beautifully. Mm-hmm. He hulked up, hit the leg drop, and at two and three quarters, Rock kicks out. The crowd can't Hogan believe attempts, it. Hogan attempts a second leg drop, two Rock bottoms. Rock nips up, hits the people's elbow. Rock yes. hits the pinfall. I give this match five stars. Yeah. Not just because of how good of a match it was, 
it was that iconic. It influenced me a lot as a wrestling fan. And when I think about some of the first wrestling matches I watched, Hogan and Rock is the first one. Yeah. When it comes to the stare down, to everything in between, how this match made me not only a huge Rock fan, but a huge Hogan fan. Yes. Sometimes a five-star match is not a technical masterpiece. Right. Sometimes a five-star match isn't about near fall after near fall, kicking out of finishers, doing triple quadruple moonsaults off the top rope into barbed wire tables. Sometimes mm-hmm. a wrestling match, a good wrestling match, a five-star wrestling match is the environment, where you were, what you were doing, and how that match influenced you. Where were you guys when uh, The Rock versus Hulk Hogan happened on pay-per-view? I'd like to know in the comments below. Um, but yeah, I agree. Five stars out of five. One of my favorite Mania matches of all time, personally. Um, this is the match that kind of made me a fan. I was hooked. Um, I, I loved it. It's, I agree. It's not the best worst match. This is not a Savage versus Steamboat. This is not a Shawn Michaels versus Kurt Angle. It's not even a Shawn Michaels versus Undertaker. But this match had the emotion. The crowd was completely invested. The storytelling was completely on point from both ends. Hogan, man, Hogan really brought the emotion. This is probably the best match of his entire career. The Rock really made him work. I mean, you can't really go wrong here. This was the best. This was the best. Like, it was. I, I it truly see. was. After the match, Hogan Rock extends the Hogan extend the extends the hand for the handshake. They shake hands. They hug. NWO then hits the ring, and they're not. Jerry Lawler says, "Are they mad? Hogan lost the match." No, they are mad because Hogan shook Rock's hand. And yep. there, you could say, if this was any other show, I would say, hey, they could have saved this for the Raw after. But I think this was perfect. They turned on Hogan right then and there. Yeah. Rock made the save. Afterward, Rock said, you know what? Hollywood Hulk Hogan is dead. Bring back original Hulk Hogan. Pose for the fans. Be yeah. Hulk Hogan, basically. Rest in peace, NWO. Hulkamania is running wild from this point forward. Um. And after that whole beatdown two-on-two, um, Hogan goes to leave. The Rock is like, no, 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 no. Come back in the ring. And he, like, you know, he mimics the, like, you know, the pose down for the crowd and, like, you know, doing this thing. Um, and he urges Hulk Hogan to get back in the ring to do it. And sure enough, he does. And the crowd eats all that shit up. The Rock eats it up. He's smiling in the ring. Um, they leave together up the ramp and Hogan raises Rock's hand at the top of the ramp. You have that proverbial passing of the torch moment at the end. <sighs> what else is there to say about this? What a match. match really? What a match. There is one Amazing. thing I can say from a smart uh, perspective. You know what would have been a better, would have been a better match for Backlash? Rock and Hogan versus Holland Nash. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just going to we'll, leave it we'll at that. We'll save that. We'll save that for, uh, for next month. But uh, it's after this match where the attendance record of 68,237 is announced by the Fink. Um, after this, we kind of get the cool down. Triple threat match for the women's title. Jazz, the champion, defending against Lita and Trish Stratus. How the hell do you follow one of the best WrestleMania matches of all time? You don't. And you know what? It wasn't the ladies' fault. They put no. on a fine enough match. Um, one thing, okay, I know we've come a long way as society. But here's the thing, WWE. If you're going to do a spot where Trish Stratus is going to do something cool, like rip off her pants and reveal she's wearing the Maple Leaf tights, don't cut to the crowd right before it happens. Yeah. Don't, don't do that. It bugs the shit out of me. Trish is also in her hometown on this show. Forgot yeah. to mention. S- side um, note. So I was telling uh, my girlfriend the other day, hey, I'm actually getting very used to wrestling being in front of no crowd. And the first thing she says is, oh, is it because they're not doing the awkward camera shots of the crowd? I go, no, that's not the main reason, but it sure as hell is a, a luxury. Oh. <laughs> it's nice. Interesting. I have to worry about, hey, here's AJ Styles debuting in the WWE. Let's cut to Roman Reigns. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to think about that. Um, but Anywho, the, crowd, the crowd is the dead for this match. Put on a fine enough match. Yeah, Trish yeah. and Lita are double teaming Jazz, who's awesome. Um, Jazz has a Boston Crab or a half crab on Trish. Um, weird submission hold on Lita. Um, 
oh, man, uh, Lita, Lita actually hit a blue thunder bomb at one point in this match, which really yeah. shocked me. I was like, that was a blue thunder bomb right there. Yeah. Um, Lita also did a double moonsault onto Trish Stratus and Jazz, but Trish Stratus was nowhere near her. So even if Jazz didn't put up her knees, she wouldn't have touched Trish Stratus. She was like 10 feet away from her. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't know. This match was match was fine. Uh, right. Jazz Jazz right. hits a mean fisherman suplex for sure. Um, Lita and Trish start fighting uh, after double teaming Jazz for the majority of the match. Uh, awkward back body drop on Trish. I don't know if again there was a miscommunication there, but it was a rough landing. Uh, twist of fate on Jazz. Um, Trish uh, Trish was knocked out of the ring at one point. There was a really awkward landing on the bulldog attempt. Like her leg was caught up in between the ropes and it looked like her ankle was all twisted and mangled and it just did not look comfy. Uh, thankfully, she was okay. Uh, finish comes around. Jazz hits a super fisherman suplex on Lita. That gets a three count. Uh, star and a half. Uh, not really much. Yeah, it was a fine enough it. match. It was yeah. filler. It was there to somewhat calm the crowd down yeah not but, the worst not the worst match on the show the work was decent but the crowd did not care at all for this um but you know before we get to the main event uh christian is about to make his grand escape after winning the hardcore title but before he gets into the car maven remember him the original hardcore champion shows yep. up rolls up christian maven after all of this crazy hijinks from it going to spike dudley to hurricane to mighty molly to christian Maven regains the Hardcore Championship. After all that in. shit. It ends up he back on off Maven. In Christian's getaway car, and in the best way to send this segment off, Christian throws a temper tantrum in the parking lot. I loved it. That's five, five, five Hardcore title changes on this show, and it ends up on the guy That's... that started off the show. Gold Dust versus Maven, five stars. God. Uh, speaking of five stars, main event is for the Undisputed World Wrestling Federation Championship. And Chris you're not, Jericho. You're not going to sit there and tell me you gave this match five stars. Are I, you? I, I didn't. Uh, okay. Chris Jericho, <laughs> accompanied by Stephanie McMahon versus the 2002 Royal Rumble winner, Triple H, who is played to the ring by Drowning Pool, not Motorhead. This comes off very, very strange. Yeah, like, but he was performed by, from, by Motorhead the year before. He was, but, like, nothing against Drowning Pool. But if it's not Lemmy, it just doesn't sound right if it's Triple H coming to the ring. You like, know a Good point. I think three years later, Motorhead would perform Triple H to the ring again. To maybe at 21. Yeah. Hey, exactly guys, right. you'll want to see a world title match where the world champion is not the focal point of the feud? Hey, everyone, you want to watch a WrestleMania main event where the main story is between the challenger and his ex-wife who is outside the ring? God damn it. Yeah, the undisputed champion was the surrogate in what was essentially Triple H versus Stephanie. Um, you know what? I'm going to say it right now. This match should not have gone on last. Rock and Hogan should have. Yeah. It, I understand I, I the world title needing to be the main event, and WrestleManias in the future would learn from this. And yeah. that the world title does not need to be the main event of every show. It doesn't. If that was the case, we would have gotten John Cena and Batista closing out WrestleMania, not Taker and Michael. Yeah. The we Universal got. we got the Universal Championship opening the show one year now. It's like Yeah. You know, like Oh yeah. It doesn't have to be um, the main event. But like No. A Triple H's Man, left is... leg. Triple H's left leg, I should note, sorry to cut you off, but like his left leg is heavily taped. And they implied that um that it, that the quadriceps muscle was hanging on by a thread. Um, if that was the case, he would not be wrestling. He would not be. But you know what? I th as a kid, I was thoroughly convinced that Triple H's quad could have been torn at any moment in this match because Triple yeah. H was selling it really well. I feel like they told a very good story. I think this is a very underrated match, personally. Some um, positives I will say about this match. Um, after this pay-per-view, I decided that The Rock – until Shawn Michaels came back into my life, was my favorite wrestler. This match made – this show made Triple H my brother's favorite wrestler of all time. Yeah. And one thing I will say is, like, one thing I'll give him a lot of credit for is that a lot of people pick the obviouses. They pick the John Cena's. They pick the Hogan's. They pick the Rock. He saw Triple H when Triple H was probably not at the best in his career, and he picked him, and he hung with Triple H even when he was a heel. Yeah, Triple H so was – those are real fans right there. Triple H was at the top of his game right here for sure. Um, 
There are, as the match starts, there are you screwed Brett chance at Earl Hebner because it's in Canada. Um, Chris Jericho goes for the leg early. Uh, another lockup, which is, uh, you know, again, a rarity on this pay-per-view. Uh, back body drop on Jericho. Uh, really, really stiff clotheslines by Triple H. I thought the work between these two was really, really good. I always felt like their chemistry was among the more underrated. Like, because yeah. if you, you remember... Like, oh, let's just ahead. say, thank, thank, thank God we get a Hell in a Cell match between these two two months later. Yeah. Because I think that makes up tremendously and actually shows what these two can actually do when they're not following Hogan and Rock. Yeah. If you want the best match between Triple H and Jericho, watch Fully Loaded 2000. They have an outstanding last man standing match for sure. Oh, yeah. Your um, favorite match type, too. Oh, I hate the last man standing match. It's been well documented, uh, these podcasts. Okay. But uh, okay. yeah, Triple H does the Harley race knee, and Triple H sells landing on the bum knee so well. You know, um, he launches Y2J off the top rope into the front row. That's a spot I completely forgot about. Um, Jericho was in orbit at that point. Um, <laughs> and they start brawling on the outside. Triple H is taking apart the Spanish announce table. Um, to be already past the part where Stephanie is already getting in Earl Hebner's face, and Hebner is threatening to throw her out, but she might have been. She she might have been getting in his face at like this point. She is. Um, Can I just say Stephanie was just dressed like she was? She that was really pisses me off about her in this pay per view. Okay, <laughs> she was dressed in Jericho colors. What can I say? Um, you know, uh, Atomic drops at Jericho's knee. Triple H uh, goes for the figure four in the ring. This is where Stephanie gets involved. Uh, as Triple H has the figure four locked on Jericho, Stephanie, while the ref is distracted, rakes Triple H in the eye. And I'm just like, dear God, why can't it just be Triple H versus Jericho? Like, Oh, yeah. Like, Stephanie didn't need to be in this feud at all. Yeah. Like, at but all. Jericho spears Stephanie on accident, and she takes a really awkward landing on the floor. Yeah. Uh, Triple H tries a pedigree on Steph in the ring for the first time, and then Jericho hits a missile drop kick. Uh, that post, was a nice spot. I'll, I'll say that. Post Triple H's left knee, Jericho locks on a figure four um, of, on the ring post. Uh, more you screwed Brett chance at Earl Hebner. Louder this time. Yeah, the crowd Again. is very into this match, as you can tell. <laughs> they're they're into this match like you know making sure oh hebner gets his uh gets what he deserves in canada i guess yeah um yeah so jerk uh stephanie slaps triple h at some point in this little sequence uh chris jericho uses uh triple h actually leg break maneuver i don't want to say it's like an indian leg breaker but like triple h would use that move a lot um when he was uh just getting into the two-man power trip, but not quite. Like, you know, around the Rhodes WrestleMania the year before, Triple H was using that little leg lock a lot. Um, oh, yeah. And Jericho is using the ropes for leverage while working the knee because he's a heel. Um, Jericho's shoulder first into the post. Um, I mean, this match was fine. I mean, I didn't really have, like, too much of a problem with the in-ring work in this, honestly. Uh I wrote down Triple H hits a face buster. Sell that knee, Helmsley. <laughs> because, you know. Exactly. You know, his his knee was, his quad was hanging on by a thread. You remember that? He's got a torn freaking quad. Um, <laughs> but beautiful, be uh, speaking of beautiful spine busters, you got Arn Anderson, you got Booker T. Triple H hits a really mean spine buster for a false finish. Uh, Triple H send over the top rope once again, selling the knee. Jericho takes apart JR and King's announce table, and he locks on the walls of Jericho on the announce table, which is actually a callback to when Triple H hurt his knee in the first place. And JR actually names drops San Jose, California, where the injury happened. And I was like, yeah! <laughs> March out pop. for it. Where's Nick Foley when you need him? <laughs> Where's JR when I need him? But uh, – yeah, no, this match had some nice callbacks. I don't really see what – I mean, I definitely see people's problem with the placement of this match. Like, you know, like – I don't know. But Jericho counters the pedigree on the table. It's a really nice backdrop to the Spanish announced table. Triple H is, like, dead. Lion Salt, too close near falls. Um, he gets the walls in the ring – or tries to get the walls in the ring. Triple H is preventing it. Um. The pedigree is stopped by Jericho when he gets a cheap shot in on the leg, and that's when the walls of Jericho gets locked in. Um, 
And Triple H is in that thing for a while. And I also noticed Jericho is bleeding from the mouth at this point. Don't know how. Um, Hunter gets to the ropes. Jericho grabs a chair. Uh, Triple H kicks it back in his face and a DDT on the chair. I think Steph was distracting the referee at this point. Um, I could be wrong. Oh, man, this is where we get to the ending. Yeah, this match was over, like, a lot quicker than I thought. Oh, yeah. Uh, Stephanie enters the ring. She goes for a chair shot. She should not be involved in this match. Stephanie shoves uh, Earl Hebner down to the down to the mat after uh, they start arguing for a minute. She turns around. Triple H is right behind her. She goes to run away. Triple H hits a pedigree on Steph for probably the biggest pop of the match. Yeah. Yeah. Triple you know, H. Not, not between, you know, Triple H and Jericho. You know, this is like if – remember when they did this a year later but with Brock Lesnar and Paul Heyman? when Lesnar's goal was to F5 Paul Heyman. Yes, I do remember that. But I think that's he, like, this I is think, like this, but except for it's not good. I think he actually got to Paul Heyman like before WrestleMania though. So Paul Heyman oh, yeah. wasn't but, at ringside. You know, that's like if Lesnar and Angle was more about Lesnar and Heyman than it was yeah. Lesnar and Angle. You know, I'm thinking about this like, yeah, this is very similar to what they do the next year with, uh, with Lesnar and Angle. Yeah. Yeah, Except but Les- wasn't good. Yeah, Lesnar and Angle was a much a much better, better match. match than this for sure. And they didn't have to follow Rock and Hogan; they had to follow uh, Hogan that- and Vince, which in its when in, with, in itself was a very good match. And uh, Rock and Stone Cold and Stone yeah. Cold uh, oh, retirement. Yeah. What ended up being Stone Cold's retirement match, but we didn't know it at the time. But uh, yeah, after the pedigree on Steph, Jericho uh, hits Triple H in the face with a chair for a nice false finish. Uh, Jericho goes for the pedigree, and there's actually a really nice counter sequence to end this thing. Jericho springs off the second rope right into a pedigree for the three count. Triple H is the brand new undisputed World Wrestling Federation champion. Vindication, eight months of grueling rehabilitation, and Triple H has climbed the mountain. Uh, three and a half stars out of five. Uh, I have no problems with the work in the match. These two are very good. Uh, or even like the placement. Yeah. Crowd was dead. Stephanie was involved. This, I mean, this would have been the same match. I feel like regardless of where it was placed on the card. So like my main yeah. problem was Stephanie's involvement. Yeah. But, I gave it two and a half just because really of all the reasons that I stated and all the reasons that you stated, I just felt like we could have had a stronger WrestleMania main event considering <laughs> And it could have been booked better. It was just – it was what it was. We would have had a stronger Mania main event if it was Rock and Hogan there. But uh, Oh, yeah. You know, oh, yeah. say la vie. And like you said, eight months of vindication, and he's going to lose it all in three weeks. <sighs> I'm getting way ahead of ourselves, my friend. I'm already we depressed. Are. I'm already we depressed. Are. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um oh, oh, welcome. Um, that's wrestlemania yeah. 18 ladies and gentlemen a yes. very good pay-per-view that is very special to us uh it has some good stuff it has some all right stuff it had some bad stuff but at the end of the day it will always be a wrestlemania i will go back to this me wrestlemania too. is just as special to me as wrestlemania 31 would would be for me because it so far has been the only wrestlemania i've ever been to and yep. even that show as we know was not perfect but no. you can't you know you never forget your first time. And this was the very first, that was the very first WrestleMania that I attended. Just like this is the very first WrestleMania I ever watched. Yeah. Um, I would rate this show overall, probably an eight out of 10. It's a great WrestleMania. Um, emotional, good matches, hot crowd. Can't really complain too much. Never forget your first. Um, it's not the best WrestleMania of all time. There's definitely some stinkers on this card, but I mean, Oh yeah. It's, <sighs> can't really go wrong with this one it's a it's a fun one that i get to that we both get to go back to every once in a while it's on the network right now if you haven't seen it yet definitely check it out definitely worth it for the rock and hogan match for sure um oh yeah first match overall i would give the show probably a 7.5 out of 10 okay yeah that sounds about fair um 7.5 yeah somewhere in the ball yeah for sure yeah wrestlemania 18 that's it for the books uh Dear God, I'm not looking forward to the backlash review. <laughs> oh yeah, backlash indeed. Oh man, <laughs> indeed it's backlash. Honestly, and- I mean to be perfectly honest, other than 
spoiler alert, Triple H versus Hogan. I, I don't remember anything else on that show. Yeah, we're going to, I mean, we're going to, yeah, we'll, we'll get to that point. But, I mean, I'm excited to talk about this show just like I was the horror show. But, I mean, I don't want to shit on it too much. But in any regards, look, oh, out, yeah. look out for that no, review. Just out um, of sheer curiosity. That'll be our September review. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So we're going to have it up uh, probably within the next uh, – four weeks or so maybe maybe sooner than a month from now but uh oh yeah 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 no i always i always love talking wrestling with you buddy you know i just just can't help you know doing same it with you really. man it's always a, it's yeah. a good way to escape the world this right now and, uh, with Absolutely. all this wrestling footage that's available to us like just for the record i have aj styles versus daniels from destination x 2011 playing the <laughs> there's definitely a lot of wrestling for me to watch right now and i'm a tna I'm enjoying yep. it. <laughs> oh man yeah tna is another story but uh yeah thank you all so much uh for supporting the channel and watching uh the podcast um if you're new here i need you guys to hit that subscribe button down below as hard as you possibly can just make sure you leave a thumbs up on the video by the end uh look out for our reviews uh of SummerSlam coming up um as well as uh, Backlash 2002, of course, very, very soon. Uh, uh, Tomas depressed me thinking about that show. But anyway, <laughs> um, but thank you all so much again. Look forward to more fun content very soon. And with all that being said, Back Talk, commence.